Good morning. I'm Tom Fair from Thompson Hines Office of General Counsel, and I'd like to welcome you all to the 2019 uh, Professional Conduct Seminar. Is that because you couldn't hear? Um, this morning we're going to hear a discussion that's a little bit different than you hear at your usual CLE. It's a discussion about the process being undertaken to replace this very beautiful building behind us, the Justice Center. Uh, why is this a CLE topic? Because as you will hear from our panelists today, the process of replacing that building begins with understanding the process that goes on inside it, the justice process for our community. It, it starts with understanding what works in that system and what doesn't work in that system, and what are the barriers that are being created for certain segments of our community to access to justice. And then how do you address those, fix them, and get a new, a new system and a new building or buildings that work to present the best access to justice to our community. It's an important topic for our community. It's an important topic for our profession. And that's why we've made it the centerpiece of our presentation this year. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to our partner, Jeff Applebaum, and say thank you for attending. OK, is this on? Yes, you can hear me. Well, thank you and good morning. Um, before I begin, our, is that going to do that the whole time so that, oh, no. okay, thank you. Uh, uh, by the title, uh, you can see there's a question here, building a new justice center or justice system. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that title uh, because I was hired to manage the possible design and construction of a new justice center. I didn't know that I was hired to help manage uh, the construction of a new justice system. Uh, that was my journey, and I will talk to you about that journey as we go through today's uh, meeting. In a few minutes, I'll introduce some folks here uh, that have, are going on that journey with me. Uh, but let me first begin with just a couple housekeeping points because I've been told to do this. Um, first of all, uh, parking. There are vouchers at the registration desk. If you parked here, get a voucher. We'll take care of your parking. Uh, there is a sign-in sheet. Uh, I guess you have to sign in if you want your CLE. Uh, and there's an evaluation form uh, that we'd like you uh, to fill out. I was supposed to put something on here next that talked about the fact that we have bathrooms. We do have bathrooms. <laughs> um, uh, they're located outside of this room, so you'll find them. How's that? Um, uh, then uh, there is a self-study code. If you are uh, not with us here in person, but you're going to be seeing the video, uh, there is a self-study code. I am told that the self-study code has to be on the last slide. Uh, because you are therefore forced to go through the whole presentation until you are able to write down the self-study code. Clever. Uh, but it will be, there is a self-study code on the last slide. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, let me just very quickly, uh, by way of introduction, uh, uh, I am the, for over 40 years, almost 42 years, uh, I've been uh, at Thompson Hine. Uh, for most of that time, I have uh, uh, been a partner uh, in charge or the practice group leader of our construction and it's really a construction and development group. Um, about 23 years ago I formed a ancillary business called Project Management Consultants or PMC. Uh, PMC consists not only of lawyers but uh, burnout architects, burnout engineers, burnout construction managers. And when I say this, these are people who have been in the business 20, 25 years. They're actually great. And we also have financial planners and others. And we do large community impact projects all over the country. We both form them, develop them, put them together, manage them, uh, and, uh, and facilitate them. And uh, typically, uh, what we did and what I have done uh, has been uh, stadium, arena projects, uh, university projects, school projects, uh, convention centers here in Cleveland. We were responsible for the convention center. In back of you, the convention center hotel. We did a few small courthouse projects, but never 
uh, until this project did we ever uh, uh, undertake a major, a major justice center project of this dimension. Very few have. And of course, the reason we got tapped to do this is because we've done historically a lot of work uh, for the county and other public-private partnerships. So before I get into this, and I will introduce some other folks in a minute, I'm not ignoring them, I'm going to introduce them when they come into the story, okay? Uh, let me begin by giving you uh, just a little bit of history. So, um, going back to the beginning, on the left, uh, you see there the actual first courthouse in jail when we were a bit of a smaller town. It's a very small building, a one-room building, and it served as our courthouse in jail from 1812 to 1830. The next building was our second courthouse, uh, served for 30 years until 1858. That was actually on the southwest corner of what we now call Monumental Park, or what we did call Monumental Park, we now call Public Square. The third courthouse, kind of stately, 1858, by the way, this is pretty interesting uh, because I have now looked at four sources for this courthouse and every source I've looked at says, exact location unknown. I'm sure that somehow we can figure out where this courthouse was. I don't know where this courthouse was, but that's what it looked like in 1858. Um, oddly enough, the fourth courthouse, also the exact location unknown. Maybe it's still there somewhere. But that was quite a building, as you can see, uh, in 1875. And that served us uh, until uh, we built uh, the old uh, courthouse, what we now call the old courthouse in 1912. That building that you see there, um, uh, obviously, and by the way, it is still the current home of three courts. It's the current home of the Domestic Relations Court, it's the current home of the Probate Court, and it's the current home of the 8th District Court of Appeals. Uh, it also housed uh, um, the Common Pleas Court, uh, and in fact, it did that until about 1931. It also had the Criminal Division. Now, this is kind of interesting. Right now, our court is integrated. We have one, all judges are in one division, uh, but actually in uh, 1931, we built a county criminal courthouse in jail. We separated these systems and that building was there from 1931 until 1976, a classic Art Deco building. Uh, it fell into disuse. I remember seeing it uh, when I came to Cleveland. Uh, but it was torn down sometime in the in the 1990s. Uh, but in 1976, uh, we had uh, we built the edifice that we now know as the Justice Center. Before I go any further, I want I want to ask one question: Of those folks in the room, how many of you actually have practiced or have practiced uh, um, uh, advocacy? The, not, not just transactional, but advocacy work or work that has taken you to the courthouse. Most of you. Uh, how many of you uh, have any portion of your practice uh, that is a cr a criminal work, where you will actually uh, do criminal cases there? Uh, a couple of you, which is why, by the way, initially I was going to do polling to get your opinions about different things. When I figured out that we're not going to have any criminal lawyers here, I figured out most of your opinions actually don't even matter. So, <laughs> so uh, that's, why I, that's why I dispense with the polling exercise, uh, just so you'll know. Uh, uh, but in any event, um, because this is all about, 80% of this is all about really what happens in the criminal law practice. We go there, there's civil courts, they're important. It's not the driver of any of this. This is driven by the criminal law practice. Uh, predominantly. So in any event, Justice Center in 1976. Now, a few things about the Justice Center. 25 stories tall, 400, or 25 stories, 420 feet tall. In that building, there's a lot of functions that happen in that building. But in that main building, uh, there are 44 courtrooms and nine hearing rooms, and they're shared by the Common Pleas Court and the Cleveland Municipal Court in that building. Uh, there's attached to it, and you can see it there on the left, is the Police Administration Building, uh, which uh, is now, um, the police are still there because they're renting space there. They originally were going to leave. Uh, they had another space planned. Uh, they're now renting space there, and they just announced uh, a week ago uh, that they're now going to move to a, build a new building in an Opportunity Corridor, which is and there's some interesting question about that, but that is, that is the direction they're taking. Uh, 
then in back is jail one, what is referred to as jail one, 956 beds. But at the time this was built, there was jail one only. Uh, interestingly, uh, the budget for this project, when announced in 1972, was $62 million. By the time it was built in 1976, the cost was $179 million, three times as much. Part of that had to do with some modifications and additions. Part of it had to do with uh, wrangling and issues that, that, that went between the city and the county and things that happened. But under any circumstance, this was viewed as a rather remarkable increase in cost. Uh, something uh, I am told we are not supposed to repeat again uh, with any new project. Now, uh, there's an interesting comparison here. Uh, at or about the same time, uh, you are all familiar with what at the time was the tallest building, uh, I think in the world, Sears Tower, right, in Chicago, built at or about the same time. And I'm going to tell you why Karen is smiling in just a second. Uh, built at or about the same time, completed three years earlier. And the interesting thing about that number, $179 million, that was also the number that it cost to build the Sears Tower. The Sears Tower, by the way, uh, is almost three times taller. It is way more than double the square footage. Sears Tower is over 4 million square feet. This complex, even after they added Jail 2 that I'm going to talk about, is about 2 million square feet. Uh, so the question is, and by the way, a couple years ago, the Sears Tower was sold for $1.3 billion. Uh, that complex would not sell for <laughs> $1.3 billion. One thing that's really interesting about the Sears Tower, you may say, well, maybe it was simply because the project was well managed. And, and here is, uh, this is my Jim Robinald. If you know Jim Robinald, this is my Jim Robinald moment when I connect everything up, right? You know? uh, so the guy who ran the Sears Tower project was Karen's father, uh, Philip Chen. Uh, and we'll introduce Karen. But uh, she, and she grew up in Chicago and she lived that life uh, because Sears Tower, he was actually the, not only did he manage the project, uh, not only uh, when Sears Tower started operating, uh, was he responsible for that? There's even a, uh, you can go on YouTube, what's the name of the? On the show, Mo uh, Modern Marvels. Modern History Marvels, you can, you can see, uh, Sears Tower. You can see uh, Karen's father talk all about it. I still haven't introduced Karen yet, but, <laughs> but now you at least know about Karen's father. And so by the way, we always will call it the Sears Tower. We will not call it, it I, I don't family, even know what it's, it's like, it's, Sears it's, yeah, it's Sears Tower. That's, that's what it is, all right. But that's an interesting comparison. Now, uh, ever since that building was built, uh, I will tell you it has had operational and functional issues since it started. One thing I should tell you, in my career, I started the first 10 or 15 years of my career, I was a uh, construction claims lawyer. I did construction cases. I then, I still do some of that work. I've switched over, obviously, to transactional consulting and project management. But I had a lot of these cases. Uh, there were all kinds of issues that happened there. That's one typical issue. That, that building has leaked from the outside. It's leaked from the inside. Uh, that's a great picture I found of a, of a burst water line in 1982. It's had other issues. Uh, if you ever practice in those courts, you know that we, uh, by the way, the materials are very expensive, very fancy granite, marble that wood slat uh, that you see in the courthouses that made everyone so sick and dizzy that you had to replace them. A lot of interesting choices, but problems from day one. So I should also tell you uh, that what then happened was Jail 2 was built. It was built in uh, 1995. It added 480 beds. By the way, if you add the number of beds up, uh, that still comes out to about 1,400 beds. There was then about $20 million worth of work and other things that increased uh, the rateable beds to about 17 something. I can't remember the exact number, a little over 1,700. Uh, and then you're going to ask, well, wait a minute. I, I've heard that there's been 2,300 people in that jail. Yeah, 2,300 people in a jail rated for 1,700 something. And we'll talk about what that means. Uh, but uh, ultimately, uh, that was done for $68 million. Uh, just a little quick conversion. If we did nothing else, uh, if we built that those buildings today, 
just converting to today's dollars with conversion, Justice Center built today would be $912 million, jail $251 million. Those other, those other, and I didn't put it in there, those other revisions to bring it up would be about another $100 million. So actually that building replaced today as is would be about $1.2 billion, uh, just so, just give you a comparison. Let me tell you one more thing, and I want to go back to jail one for a minute. Uh, this is a, an important diagram, and I'm going to have Andy talk about this in a while. Uh, a lot of people uh, knock uh, the building and talk about programmatically how, di how bad it is. Well, in 1976, it really did, parts of it represented the state of the art, and here's an example. Uh, if you look at the outside of Jail One, uh, you, you know, look at the building, and you'll see that you know you, you see those indentations. You see that's what's going on on the outside. Uh, these are these are um, these the housing units, and at this point in time, there actually was something here. This concept of direct supervision, which was a uh, an important concept, and it still is an important concept. The idea is that you could have single cells all around, and uh, with direct supervision. Uh, you should be able to uh, get advantages. It should avoid some of the problems we've actually seen in the system, by the way. Uh, but what you're seeing there is a little over 20 cells. Uh, and by the way, notice that there's really nothing connected. Uh, anybody who has to go anyplace else in the jail to do anything, whether they go to the recreation area, uh, whether they go to meet a lawyer, they have to go to someplace else, uh, even, even, you know, uh, meeting rooms, other rooms, there's nothing else there. Uh, we're going to show you later on what a modern jail looks like and what it does. But that is structurally, that is what it is. You can't really modify that. Uh, and I just wanted to kind of show you that because we're going to compare that to something else later on. Any, uh, there's a limitation to what you can do for direct supervision. And anytime you have to go anywhere, you have to transport people and you have you have personal uh, and other, other, other issues with that, but that's that jail one housing block. So in any event, uh, now let's talk about a little bit about what happens with this uh, building. Uh, by, about t by the early, actually for 20 years, people have known this building's a problem. A lot of money has been spent on Band-Aid fixes and other issues. <laughs> In 2013, there was a facility condition assessment report. At this point in time, and this is, you know, we have this, this new government, and we're trying to figure out how to consolidate, what to do with real estate. So uh, a, a, a good uh, crew of individuals went in and scoured these buildings, looked at every aspect of these buildings. And all they're doing now, they're not thinking about program. They're not thinking about how the buildings function, whether they do what they're supposed to do. They're just trying to figure out whether they're going to continue to operate, you know, uh, whether the mechanical systems, the electrical systems, the plumbing systems, the structure, the roof, uh, you know, is it going to, you know, what, what does it take to keep the building going? Because it's, it's literally falling apart. Uh, and let me tell you what these, and there's a, uh, a vast report that talks about all these systems, but let me tell you what these percentages are. What these percentages are, uh, they took a look at the actual asset value of these buildings. So imagine you had a house and your house has a value of $400,000, all right? Then what they said is, okay, just to fix the components of the house to let it keep going, to fix the roof, to fix your plumbing, to fix your mechanical and electrical systems. If you have a, a stove which is broken, to replace the stove, how much would it cost compared to the value of your house? That's what this, what this is. And no programmatic changes. We're not, we're not adding anything new. We're not changing programmatically how it works just to fix it. These are the percentages of the cost of that value uh, to fix the system. So they determined that that quartz tower, just the fix it work uh, in 2013 would be 56% of the actual value of the house. If, you're, if you have a million dollar house, because it's easier for me to do the calculation, uh, it would take $560,000 of work just to repair the roof and do everything to bring it back to what that million dollar house is supposed to be. 56% for the courts, courts Tower, 47% for Jail 1, 23% for Jail 2 because it was a newer building, 72% for that police building. 
So this got people to recognize pretty quickly, wait a minute, is it really worth the cost to make these repairs and do these things, especially if we're not changing these buildings programmatically to, to act like modern courts and, and modern, modern jails. So what then happened is there was a planning report that was done in 2014 that said, okay, what are our options here with these numbers? And I will tell you that they looked at six renovation options uh, and what they figured out is just to do this renovation work would cost 300 to 428 million dollars depending on which option you picked a huge amount of money without really getting much done and very limited programmatic changes uh, and at that time they said well if we actually did something new built a new building on a new campus at that time it was really not known what that would be uh, I will tell you what then happened. Oh, by the way, this is the most important part about the whole thing. There is a page, and I'm gonna come back to this. If you take a look at uh, the planning report, they did, have, uh, they did have an assumption of what you would have to do if you built new, what you, would have to, what you would have to cover. And they did a projection, and they said, well, we believe that if you plan, if you build new, renovate whatever you do, you have to assume a jail population of 2,600 inmates. And let me tell you why they said that. They said, look, we've looked at a 10-year history, and in that 10-year history, we have grown to 2,300 inmates from about 1,900 inmates, and we're at 2,300, and we've, been cons and we've been consistently growing, and they carried it out 10 years, and they said with that growth rate, it's pretty predictable that we're gonna be up to 2,600. So they said anybody who plans a new project, just keep plan on having a jail that houses 2,600 people. By the way, uh, even though, and if you wanna just think about what that would be, that jail right now, those two buildings are pretty enormous buildings. Now I know we have 2,300 people in them, but they're designed poorly for 1,700 people. If they were designed properly with proper programs for 23, there would be a lot more to them because we have two people in cells where there should be one person, for example. Uh, 26 would be a very, very, very substantial project. But nevertheless, you know, that's what our that planners at the time are saying we need to do. Not really questioned. That's, the, that's what the professionals say. So what then happens from 2014 to 2016, uh, there is consideration of build new options. And uh, this was not that public, but there were uh, 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 some, there was some stuff being done to think about new options. And finally, in 2016, and I will tell you in 2016, that's when I entered the picture. Uh, and a couple things are happening. I want to be careful about this behind the scenes. One thing that's happening is that the, uh, I would just say that the county is thinking they're going to go ahead and do this project and they will consult with the judges. They didn't think that the judges were going to be at the table helping to make decisions. That was not a very good idea. Uh, if you want to do anything with these courts and if you want to do anything with these jails, you got to figure out how the judges become involved uh, because they can block this project if they don't like what you're doing. It's got to be collaborative. Any project we do, we'd like to do collaboratively. So we actually had some visioning sessions in 2016 to talk about how one might go about doing a project like this. And we had visioning sessions. We brought the judges in, or some judges in, and we had sessions and we collaboratively said there's going to be a set of guiding principles. Uh, and these were the guiding principles that everybody agreed to. You don't have to spend a lot of time looking at these things, but basically look at the first one, process. We're, that We said we're gonna implement a collaborative, inclusive, and transparent process that involves key stakeholders in a confidential setting. Well, that, that changed, by the way. Uh, but which will ultimately elicit uh, public support. And then we had other ideas, cost control, operations, plan efficient, uh, uh, you know, designed for efficient court operations, uh, the courts and jails, the courts in particular, you know, uh, convey the dignity and authority of the courts, uh, provide for security, really good improved access to justice, flexibility for future planning, integration, 
that may change of facilities, but these were the thoughts at the time. Uh, now, uh, and t for the most part, those are still guiding principles today. So with these guiding principles, the county said, okay, we're going to start a project. And at that point in time, uh, they had a project manager and owner's rep. And uh, at that point in time, that's where I got involved. Where's Mike Wass? That's Mike Wass. Mike Wass is with Kitchell. Uh, and at that point in time, uh, my company, PMC, uh, we wanted to find a company that was involved in the construction uh, of these facilities, but who would not compete in Cleveland, Ohio. I needed someone with construction and specific expertise, design expertise, who could do cost estimates, help me with scheduling, uh, and we specifically did not want to hire someone who would compete ultimately for the project here. It couldn't be a Turner or a Gilbane or anyone like that. So uh, we found Kitchell, who has great expertise in this, uh, but swore they would never build a project in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, right, right. Uh, and uh, so we became partners and we've been working uh, since then. In 2018, we were selected to start this process. And we knew that the first thing we would do is hire a programmer. And you'll hear more about that. And we agreed and we said we want to use a collaborative process. We actually said we want a committee and that we wanted all decisions made by a supermajority. We didn't necessarily say whether it would be a public process. Uh, we said, but we were going to have public stakeholders. At that point in time, something happened. A year went by because the judges who were in our process and others said, okay, we'll agree to this process, but we have to have the assurance that the county will agree to anything that the committee comes up with. Uh, Armin Budish basically said, uh, you can trust me on that. Uh, the judges basically said, well, we don't exactly trust you. We need a written document and we need a memorandum that says how this is going to work. It took a year for that memorandum to be finalized, uh, back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And there really wasn't a lot of impetus to get this done, uh, except one thing happened. Uh, during that year. Does anyone know what might have happened to drive this project forward? Yeah, 10 people in the jail uh, died or eight people then uh, after that. So there's a crisis in the jails. People are saying, what is going on? What are the issues in the jails? Uh, and people start to say, we have to do something about this justice center and this justice system. That's what drove this to happen. Uh, and it's the only silver lining in any of that because it finally drove people to action, not only on this center, but on what the rest of what we're going to talk about. So in 2019, there is a memorandum of understanding. Uh, so this MOU uh, uh, was created among public stakeholders who would ultimately have the fiduciary obligation uh, to uh, to participate in this project or fund this project or be a part of it. These are the 12 public entities who are on the executive committee. And as you can see, uh, you know, it's the mayor, it's the county executive, it's the, uh, the, the key to both, the, the chief or the president of both councils, the county prosecutor, the county sheriff, the public defender, uh, and there are three courts involved. Because at this point in time, at least, the Common Police Court, the Cleveland Municipal Court, and the Domestic Relations Court, which sits in the other building, all wanted to be part of this process. The Court of Appeals and the Probate Court uh, are not yet, are not, they're watching the process, they haven't committed to it yet, and that's, a, that's an issue that will, it's a side issue. But these are the participants in the process right now. The next thing that happened, uh, by the way, in, in the MOU, the way the MOU works, is that this committee is responsible to attend important informational meetings, participate in fact gathering, and exercises that we lead in our programming team, that I still haven't introduced because they, they're not yet part of the picture, uh, lead. Um, and, um, and these meetings, I didn't say they're, they're public meetings. We had a major public meeting yesterday. You may have read in the newspaper today something about that meeting. And by the way, because the meeting took place yesterday, the second half of my presentation changed today because I get to show you all this stuff now. So uh, uh, 
The committee is responsible to consider alternatives and make, quote, determinations. These are their decisions. And every major matter they get to make, they vote on the determination. Uh, every determination requires a supermajority vote. If I can't get 10 of the 12 to agree, we have no agreement. And you're going to say, that sounds insane. You're going to get these people who can't agree on anything to get 10 of 12 to agree on everything? And the answer is yes, but that's okay because it's in a public setting. So anybody who doesn't agree, they speak up and they don't agree. And actually, the supermajority is what forces this to happen. Because what we can't have is go forward and have someone, you know, and I told you so, a naysayer, they have to agree. And we have to come up with such a compelling case for what we're talking about that it is worthy of agreement. It's a very tough issue. Now, that assumes that people don't act, that's, that assumes people act rationally. Enough said. Uh, so in any event, uh, so that is, that's how this MOU works. And by the way, here's some of the key determinations that they make. Uh, and that first one was the selection of the program, or we, we had an interview process they recommended, but all that stuff in black, that's all things that are happening during this programming, this programming phase right now. Uh, these are determinations about, uh, and we'll talk about what the program is, but they get into uh, issues of the, the big issues. What is the configuration of the building gonna look like? Where if, if it's not on site, what, what's the criteria for where things could be located? What's in the building? And we're gonna show you some of that later today about some of the key criteria. Uh, the programming phase will end, uh, hopefully, in uh, April, May. These are all things that they get to agree to beyond the programming phase, but we're gonna focus on the programming phase right now. But those are some of the things that they all get to agree on. So, what does this process look like? And um, uh, there's a startup, and we started up with goals. We then go into this programming and project definition phase. What we are doing right now is we are making determinations about what are the spaces that are needed uh, in the courts. Uh, what are the what are the litigation spaces that are needed in the jail? What do we need and what services do we need to provide? How do operations work? What has to be adjacent to what? Uh, you know, what is the site criteria? We have to look at all these options and figure out what this thing has to look like and what it has to do. Now, there's three things that have to happen in parallel with this, unless we're gonna have huge delays. The city and the county right now both occupy these buildings. What's their deal going to be? Does the county own it and is, does the city rent it? Do they have co-ownership? Who pays for what? That's not easy, but that has to be done in parallel. What's the funding plan? Uh, how are we going to pay for this? If it goes out to the community, if we issue bonds, how's that going to work? What's the amount? Uh, are there other methods for financing and paying for it? And uh, what if there is other real estate involved? Uh, I had the great experience of doing our convention center project, and one of the really interesting things that happened there was I was given the project after the site was announced, but before the private real estate interests were secured. By the way, uh, as you may recall with the Kilo case, we couldn't use eminent domain for that purpose. So we actually had, if you may remember, the Sportsman's Cafe, we announced the project was gonna be on that site and no one had yet bothered to go and cut a deal with the Sportsman's Cafe. That property was appraised at $375,000 and the next day uh, she uh, uh, announced that her sale, her price for the building was, that little thing was $10 million. Um, <laughs> that's not how you do these things. Now we, we managed through that and took care of it, but you know you have to have a real real estate strategy if you're gonna talk about other sites. So this all happens. Uh, we get the program done, and then we move on to the design phase, plan acceptance, and everything that happens with figuring out how to design it and how to build it. But we're here. We're in this phase right now. That's what this is all about. So, so programming and planning. There were some initial assumptions that everybody made before we started the project. 
Uh, and the initial assumptions were we weren't permitted any assumption. We could not have a preconceived notion. Renovate or build new, no preconceived notion. Are the courts and jails connected or separate? No preconceived notion. As to real estate, does that committee decide the site? Absolutely not. That would be crazy and it's in public meetings, but we can talk about the criteria. What would any site have to have in terms of access to the public, uh, in you know, public transportation, how far from downtown or downtown, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of things about site criteria, parking, what kind of parking, those sorts of things could be the criteria, but not a specific location. As to budget, all I can tell you is that all costs had to be considered, not just the first cost, the building cost, but the long-term operational cost and the manpower uh, uh, needed to actually operate these facilities, which varies dramatically depending on what you do and financing cost. We're almost to the point where I get to introduce my guest. By the way, here is my, my initial false assumption. My initial assumption in 2016 was that I was hired to manage a Justice Center building project. I was wrong. Uh, what I was actually, and no one knew this, I didn't know it, I was actually hired to manage a justice system project, and you'll see how that emerged. My second assumption is that this project is driven by the courts. It's all about the courts. What are we going to do with the judges? What are we going to do about the courts? And the jails will follow along. I was absolutely 100% wrong. This project is all about the jails. What you do with the jails drives everything, not just with this project, but also a lot about the justice system. The courts then follow along. It's the reverse. And those are two of my false assumptions when I started. The next time I do a Justice Center project, I'll know this, by the way, but I didn't know this when I started this one. So, now one last word about cost. This thing has been kicked down the road year after year after year after year. One thing I want to tell you about is construction cost. Um, generally speaking, the rate of inflation in construction is about double uh, your normal consumer price inflation. Uh, it, is, it has been that way, it will be that way. And I will tell you right now, and, and if you were in Columbus right now, you would see this. Uh, we are, it is super heated down there. We have many projects down there. Uh, they've got four projects over $500 million, by the way, that are starting up in Columbus, just so you'll know. Uh, and by the way, if you want to know why that is, um, everything that was supposed to happen in India five years ago is happening in the Midwest. The call centers for Facebook, uh, Google, all this stuff, all these call centers, all the, all the stuff, the infrastructure stuff, the back of the house stuff, it's in the Midwest. Uh, and a lot of it's in Columbus, by the way, in Indianapolis and, 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 and uh, Omaha and places like that. We need more of it here, but that's, that's why it's so superheated. In any event, uh, it is foreseeable that our inflation rate for construction over the next five or six years is going to be no less than 4% and probably closer to 6%. If we use 5%, I will tell you this project at a minimum, there's nothing you're going to do here that's less than, that's less than $500 million. It's going to be more than $500 million. But if it was just $500 million, every year you wait is $25 million more. So that's $2 million a month, maybe $3 million a month. Every month you wait to do something for what you have to ultimately do. And at the same time you're waiting, you're putting Band-Aids on the current building. So you're spending money that you are going to replace. So that's the cost of waiting. That's the cost of delay. So now we talk about the first step. We have to select our independent programmer. We need industry experts who know exactly how to program a building like this. Uh, in some projects that are less, less sophisticated, not less sophisticated, but more integrated, your architect who ultimately does the project uh, may be your programmer. But on a project like this, uh, there are a lot of consultants, a lot of people with really, really specific industry knowledge that ideally you will assemble as a team to give you the best knowledge in the world on this stuff. And so what we did is in January, this is when this kicked off of this year, we put out an RFQ and there were actually three fabulous teams uh, that uh, were put together and responded to the RFQ. There's just one that was more fabulous than the other two. Uh, we shortlisted these groups in February uh, they were interviewed on March 5th. 
They were selected on March 5th. Of course, these are two members of our team, and I'm going to introduce them. That's Andy Couples, who leads the team, and Andy will tell you this, that they were selected on March 5th, and I called him on March 6th, and I gave him two messages. The good news is you've been selected, and the bad news is you are behind schedule. Um, uh, and uh, that's what occurred. So let me show you a little bit about the team. This is the team. And um, so the team, the lead on our programming team uh, is the DLR group. And many of you know Westlake Reed Laskowski here in town. Uh, uh, Paul Westlake, uh, just, it just so happens that uh, Paul joined, they're, they're, they merged with DLR. It's one of the largest design firms in the country. It's now actually the largest office of any design firm in Cleveland, DLR. Uh, but the, the detention and court specialists uh, were not located in Cleveland. It's Andy's group in, in LA and other places. Andy assembled a team. Uh, which consists of uh, Dan Wiley, who's our court's specific programmer, uh, Karen in detention planning, and Pulitzer uh, Bogard uh, in detention programming. That's Curtis Pulitzer. Um, and they are our prime players. And then we have a whole slew of individuals who are local, uh, some local, some minority, who provide some local knowledge. So what I'm now going to do, I'm going to take one second before I go on with my story. This is Andy. Andy, why don't you take a second and just uh, give our folks uh, just a couple minutes uh, to introduce yourself and your background and how delighted you're here to be in Cleveland uh, as I continue with the story. Uh, my name is Andrew Couples. Uh, I am an architect. I've been doing justice work for about 30 years. Karen and I actually have a relationship of that long and projects go back that far, jails, courthouses. Uh, police facilities, but we, we try to bring to every project we, we, we do the sense that we can actually make a difference. That is not just about doing a building, that as Jeff's been talking about as an introduction, that it really starts with understanding what's driving the system and what we can do better for people. And I think that's what you'll hear from Jeff and Karen as we go through the presentation Don't away, today. Yeah. Don't give it away, yes, that's right. Okay. And, and then Karen. Wait, we can't give anything away. We can't, can't give any surprises away. This is Karen. Hello. I'm very happy to be here this morning. I'm Karen Chin with Chin Planning, and I've been doing this work for over 35 years. Um, and it's really based on my whole philosophy is about social justice and that um, when I wasn't going to tour the Sears Tower with my father when he was building it, we were had social justice uh, really instilled in our family. And as we know in a jail, it's primarily a pretrial population, so it's really important to look at who's in there for what reason. I'm also very much a fiscal conservative, and I believe we've, um, you know, we need to look very closely before you start building a new facility to look at not just the operation and capital costs, but the human capital that uh, and, and what is at stake when people are in a jail and to make sure that you have the right people incarcerated because of course we need that, um, but it's not the answer for everything. So that's kind of my role in the project. And as you're gonna find out, and we'll use that for the, put that down. So I don't, so I don't the only problem with these people is they lack passion. You're going to find out how passionate they are about the things we talk about. Uh, one of the things that happened in the interview, by the way, is almost immediately, um, unlike maybe the other two groups, they, almost from the get-go, they weren't talking about our justice center. They were talking about our justice system. Uh, when they saw or thought that, you know, we're talking about, you know, a jail for 2,900 uh, people, uh, well, why? Have you tested that assumption? Do you know how expensive that is? Is that really what you want to be doing? So I'll get on with this. So um, starting point, and I'm going to, uh, in a few minutes, we're going to have interaction. I'm going to interact with my consultants. And you guys can speak up and ask questions, by the way. Uh, it'd be nice if we had a second working microphone to give to you, by the way, uh, to do that. So what we learned, what I learned very early on from our consultants is there's a starting point for both projects. The starting point for the jail is, okay, what population should we really be providing for? Because, and let me tell you why that's so significant. Think about this. Right now, uh, it's significant for two reasons. First of all, if someone is in that jail who shouldn't be in that jail, the impact on their life, 
uh, is extraordinary, and we can talk about that. But second of all, let me just put it in capital and cost terms. For every individual in that jail right now, we spend $125 a day. And by the way, we're probably not spending what we should be spending because they're probably not getting the services they need, but we spend $125 a day, okay? That means we're spending something close to $45,000 a year, okay? Let's just say theoretically that instead of building a jail for 2,900 people, or having an average daily population, let's say of what they're, I mean, 2,600 people, what they're projecting, let's say that average daily population was 1,600 people. And if it is $45,000 a year times 1,000 people that you could reduce it in one year, that's a lot of money, that's $45 million. Uh, but in terms of capital costs, just to build it and operate it and maintain it, not the, not the personnel cost, not the per diem, you're talking hundreds of millions of dollars in difference. So do you simply build a jail? Because I will tell you over 10 years, the difference between let's just say 2,600 and 1,600, uh, that's going to be uh, way over, that's gonna, you know, you're, you're approaching a billion dollars in 10, 15 years, way over $500 million. And over the lifetime of it, it's billions of dollars. So the question is, how do you really figure out who should be or what, what is going on? And, and how do you project that jail population? And, and by the way, I, this, this is all learning from, from Karen and others. It's about, you look at population trend. Well, are you growing or are you not growing? What is, the, what is the trend for arrests? Are you arresting more people or less people? Are the crime rate going up or down? Because this kind of should predict, right, what, what you need. Um, uh, and you take a look at what's actually happened. Uh, and, and we'll come back to this. And by the way, for the courts, what's the starting point for planning your courts? Well, uh, as I learned from Andy, you start out, at, at, and uh, Dan Wiley is not here, you start out with figuring out how many judicial officers do you have to serve. Because you look at the number of judges and you look at the number of magistrates. That really tells you the number of litigation spaces and how much support you need. That's the driver. Uh, how do you figure out how many judges you should have? Well, you would think it's your population trend in, in criminal and civil filings. The, di the difference there is it's not, it's not just variable. You don't reduce the number of judges because they have less work to do. Uh, you don't vote judges out. There are constraints uh, that may go against a, an objective assessment, and I'm gonna come back to what those constraints are in a few minutes. But we're gonna start on the jail side. Criminal justice trends. So I'm gonna start putting some information up here, and I'm gonna interact in a minute uh, with Karen uh, and Andy on this. So first of all, you look at population. Now this is a little sobering uh, for some of us. This is, and by the way, we don't, we don't make this up. We get this from the Ohio, uh, you know, Ohio Development Services Agency. There's all sorts of sources of data on this. Here's your population trend in Cuyahoga County from 2000 uh, uh, you know, to today. And this is what they're actually predicting through 2045. Now, uh, you know, over the past 20 years, our population has decreased in the county by 13.3%. And these agencies predict a further population decrease by 8% between 2020 and 2045. Mm -hmm. You may disagree with that. And you may say, wait a minute, things are turning around. We're going to do better than that. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But, you know, this is, in fact, what those agencies who are responsible to figure this out are saying, you know, and, you know, that is their expertise. That is the county. By the way, uh, this is the city. This is pretty dramatic. And, of course, we know, you go before 2008, we were a million. We were the fifth largest city in the country. Uh, and, and in 2008, we were at 408 in the city. Uh, down to 383 in 2018. That's a decrease of 6% in that year. Uh, the, uh, in the city compromises about 31% of the total population. I will say that of the people who uh, are involved with the, 
with the, uh, the jails, it's a higher percentage than that of their involvement simply because of uh, socioeconomic factors. But this shows you a decrease in population. Now certainly there are reasons uh, to believe that our population has stabilized. There is what we hope is good news out there, why we think that there may possibly even be a bottoming out and a resurgence. We all hope for that. But I will tell you that uh, you know, our consultants have to go with the facts, have to go with the objective criteria. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, right now, um, while we can talk about not losing population, we're not seeing a great return to population growth yet. But the point, of, the point is, is over the last 10 years, population has declined. That's the important thing. So that's step number one. Uh, and by the way, just a little look at some of the socioeconomic factors. You're all pretty familiar with it, what this would look like. City versus the county. Uh, and you know we do have some negative socioeconomic uh, factors. Uh, the county, the city, the city, you know, uh, simple things that are some of these quality life and health assessments, city worse than the county. The county, uh, because of some of the averaging of, of some of our issues, uh, a little worse uh, than Ohio. Uh, and you can look at these later when you have this data. Mm -hmm. um, uh, particularly this slide. Particularly yeah. this slide, because this, this slide uh, uh, talks about issues of well-being, uh, including violent crime, rate of gun deaths, rate of drug-induced uh, problems. But let me say what's really significant about all this. Despite all this, the next slide is what's interesting. Our crime rate in the county has actually gone down. Uh, from 2008 to 2017, our crime rate uh, has gone down. And here we're talking about uh, major crimes, uh, part one crimes uh, has gone down. These are the big, the big eight or big nine, whatever it is. Serious one, murder rate, Ser robbery, the big serious, serious crimes. index crimes. And it's decreased by 16.5 percent from 2008 to 2017. So the crime rate has actually gone down. Um, if we looked at the same thing for the city, the city crime rate has actually gone down, uh, which is, by the way, not that surprising. Uh, crime rates have generally gone down. In the city, it's decreased by 21.7 percent from 2008 to 2017. So the crime rate has gone down. Uh, this matches, to some degree, the state of Ohio crime rate has gone down, and the United States crime rate has gone down. So what do we know so far? For the last 10 years, population rate, uh, or the population has gone down. The crime rate, crimes per 1,000, has yes, gone crime, down. Reported crimes per 1,000. Reported crimes per 1,000. Now, and now I'm going to let um, uh, Karen, talk a little bit about this one. So the next one that was really important is arrest rate. And now I'm going to talk about a start, start the discussion of a topic which is information and data. And let me start with this dialogue. When you came to Cuyahoga County, what did you expect to be able to do with your investigation of arrest rate? What did you think you would find? Just in terms of data. Well. First of all, I thought I, I would find historic information or even last year's information on how many people were arrested in this county. Uh, and what I found for a jurisdiction of this size, and I went immediately to Jeff and said, no one's reporting arrests in the, uh, for the county. The city of Cleveland reports arrests, uh, but there is no compilation, the Uniform Crime Report, where I collected the crime data. That's the crime. And then with the point of arrest, then you, you collect arrest data. So how many people were arrested last year in this county? And it's not it's not collected. So that was a bit of a shock. You don't know. Yeah. But because if I, so what I did use was. Well, before, before you go there, let me just say okay. 24 out of 58 arresting agencies, we're talking about municipalities, do not report their arrests. And these are some surprising municipalities. I, by the way, if Hunting Valley didn't report its arrests, I wouldn't be that concerned. <laughs> uh, but uh, Bedford does not report its arrests. Uh, Shaker Heights does not report its arrests. Uh, and it's not that they don't think it's important. They wished everybody reported their arrests. They would like to know arrest trends too. But as you're going you're gonna to see a theme here, we don't have organized data collection. We don't have organized methods of looking at information in Cuyahoga County, and we don't have coordination. 
So, and we'll come back to that, but so right now, Karen, in order to figure out what you think is happening with arrests, what did you do? Well, I simply put up a slide to show what I'm seeing in other um, major uh, urban areas, and this is a, just a little graphic from the city of Philadelphia, and it's not uncommon that half the people that are arrested in a jurisdiction, it's not murder, rape, and robbery, those seven index crimes. Uh, you know, 95 percent of what people are arrested for is all the part two, which is all the other uh, crimes. And what I typically see is that half the people that are arrested are arrested for things such as alcohol, uh, substance abuse, mental health, vagrancy, prostitution, disorderly conduct, drunkenness, um, you know, again, all nonviolent offenses. Uh, and that's typically what I'm seeing. Half the population that is arrested is, again, not for the serious index crimes. So what, we, what we're going to find out, and the conclusion is, number one, for major crimes, the arrest rate is probably still down. And when you see the city of Cleveland, you'll see that's actually yes, true. I, I do have it, the data. But number two, Cleveland. who's getting arrested and what are they getting arrested for? They're not getting arrested for the may or, or the volume of arrests is not with major crimes. The volume of arrest is for class four and class five felonies right. and misdemeanors. Right, exactly. So now we look at the city of Cleveland and we can, they do report their arrests. And this is pretty, this is pretty amazing information. The total arrests in the city of Cleveland between 2008 and 2018 decreased by 60%. Um, now, you could be skeptical about this. You can say, well, part of that is population decrease. That's true, but nothing near that. You can say, well, maybe the police aren't doing their job. Uh, and there may be some of that. Uh, but on the other hand, what it really talks about is the city of Cleveland has actually been somewhat proactive with their crisis intervention team trying to avoid arrests where they can do some different things and we'll talk more about that. But the bottom line is the arrest rate has gone down and this is a national trend. Crime rate has gone down, arrest rate has gone down and in Cuyahoga County there's something else going on. Our population is going down, our crime rate is going down which is good and our arrest rate is going down and that's actually good stuff. Now, if you know those three things, oh, and by the way, there's, here's the arrest trend in the United States showing that arrest rate is going down, right? This is actually total arrest, but it's not the rate. Total arrest. Uh, yeah, it's total so arrest, the not the it's rate. Down. Total arrest, not, not, not per thousand, but total arrests are going down. Sorry about that. So here's my question for you, and this should be a mathematical calculation. If the following are true over the past 10 years, if your population is going down, and if your crime is down, and if your arrests are down, what should you be able to assume about what about the prison population? What Jail. would you assume? Down. What do you think? Is it down? Well, it's gone up. In Cuyahoga County, at the same time that population should be is going down, arrests are going down. Crime is going down during that same period. The average of what's going on in the jail has gone up. Yes. Just a quick question. Um, in terms of the, the county not reporting the arrest information, what typically happens in other parts of the country? Well, first of all, when we say reporting, the Uniform Crime uh, Reporting Division of the FBI is since 1939 has been our national database to really monitor and track what's happening to crime and arrests in our country. Reporting is voluntary. It's not required that people report data, and I've worked in some small jurisdictions where they don't. What I was so surprised here in a, in a major urban, a county with a major urban center that that should be reported. So I, I, I mean, it's not to say that I've some small counties where I've done studies, but even I've recently done two or three small jail studies and I was able to get that information. Here it'd be very difficult because you've got 56, or, um, how, what's the number, Jeff? I forgot. 50, 59. 59 uh, municipalities. 58. So, uh, you know, to go out, that would be a full-time job. Forget about the system assessment or forecast in the jail. It, so it is not required. But since 1939, across the United States, people do report that information. It's a you know, uniform database that we can monitor crime and arrest in our country. Here, here, here's, what's, here's what's different. Uh, we are, compared to all the other places you will work, we are so balkanized here. Uh, you know, normally in other major counties, you will have far fewer municipalities of, of substance. So even if you have 
Normally, there may be a coordinating agency and there's encouragement to get this information to report or you have municipalities, fewer of them that do report. <coughs> this is just an anomaly here. It's the combination of too many municipalities doing their own thing and no coordination. There's just usually more information. Right, and no enforcement of reporting yeah. the but data. But by the way, this is not the biggest problem on information. Yeah, We're going to exactly. tell you about much bigger information problems in a few minutes. So in any event, but what's the reality of what's going on? Number one, uh, average daily population. Uh, you know, the, num the number count during that same period went up. In fact, it peaked in 2018. Uh, there were 2,300 people in a jail with a rated capacity for over 1,700. And why don't you two just talk a little bit about what that was like. What, what was going on in the jail to, to stuff that many people in the jail? I'll start and then hand it over to Andy. Well, and Jeff had already mentioned it. That meant that jail cells that were built to house one um, offender are, you know, two or three people were sleeping on the floor uh, because of the, the, so many inmates in the facility. Staff were not able to move them to some of the kind of programs that they had, like NA, uh, Narcotics Anonymous or AA or other programs or services. It seriously hampered uh, counsel's access to inmates because they had to move them to various areas in the jail to be able to meet with attorneys and not able to do that when you've got so many people in an overcrowded situation, very volatile. Uh, to have that level of overcrowding in a jail. So, and if you actually looked at it, and it's really depressing, these are small cells, and you would have a cell that had one bed and, you know, your, your, your toilet sink area, and then at a point in time, they would have put bunks in, a second bunk, to try to get two in, but that's a, that's a risk, a uh, hanging risk. So then they say, okay, we can't put that up, we're gonna put it on the floor, so they put a sled. Now you have, in in a cell, there's almost room for nothing else. There's two beds, a toilet at the head of one bed, and it's, that's literally what you're looking at. It's very depressing, but that's what was going on. But the question is why uh, that so many people. So let me just go through these stats very quickly. Monthly admissions. So it's one thing to look at the population, how many are admitted, and this is monthly admissions. It also up while everything else is going down. Um, so. Uh, a little bit about in, in, inmate profile. Do you want to just talk about this for a second? Yeah. Just your observations on, in, on the profile of who yeah. these inmates We're are. Not uh, dissimilar to what I see prim primarily in a jail population. Again, it's, jail is not the same as prison. Jail is pretrial for 70 or 65 to 70 percent. They haven't been found guilty yet. Uh, a predominantly male, 80 uh, percent, 85 percent male. Uh, also, very much disproportionality in jails across the United States. So that, for example, if you're African American population, the county is 30 percent it's 70 uh, percent of the population that's in the jail also looking at length of stay of the, the average age of someone in jail is at 25 to 34 year old age group uh, and also length of stay the overall average length of stay which I think is very interesting that you have a 32 percent of the population I think it was like over a third of the population that were housed for more than 100 days so again jail pretrial you know, go through your um, court proceedings and get out, but you've got over a third of the population are that are staying in excess of three months. These are people who never been convicted of a crime. Right. These are people who are jailed. They're there in a pretrial situation, uh, and they are there for, in many cases, a third of them over a hundred days. Uh, nearly and a half have been there for over two months. Right. And there's many that have been there for more than two years. For two I mean, years. You really take. Also, not surprising, the city of Cleveland and Cuyahoga County Sheriff's Department are the major contributors in terms. And this is just a one-day snapshot of who's booked into the jail. Right. So now, uh, now, what's the nature of the offenses that they are there for? And you know, how many of these are violent offenders that really? you know, our, our risk, and how many of these are nonviolent? And let's just, just yeah. comment about this. Well, also not surprisingly, again, the population in the jail, 39% were in there for uh, committing some sort of a violent offense, and that means that 61% are in for other things. A category of other offenses includes things such as phone harassment, carrying a concealed weapon, failure to comply with an order, meaning not going to court, failure to appear in court, a bench warrant was issued, disturbing the peace, a conspiracy, you know, again, those kind of uh, non-compliant behaviors or you know issues they're able to be arrested for but they're in the jail at taxpayers dollars so, and loss of jobs and other things so here's it. one I've highlighted okay. talk a little bit about the fact that almost one in ten people are in that jail for probation violation alone it's a very important one 
uh, and it was a couple years ago when a study was done here, as high as 25%. Probation meaning that you've decided that uh, you've either been in the jail and the outcome of the judge's order is that you're going to be supervised in the community. They usually give a, a supervision period of five years, which is an uh, excessive period of time, but you're going to be supervised in the community. If you commit a new offense, you're going to get booked in on the, what your main offense is. This 8% here, which took a while to pick out, is I want to know who's coming back to the jail on a technical offense, meaning they weren't where they were supposed to be. If they were told they had to show up for a, a counseling session, uh, they had uh, have a urinalysis and they had a dirty urine, they haven't committed a new offense, but they have a technical violation. They, did, they didn't comply with what they were supposed to do. And in many jails, that's as high as 25% of the people in jail. So ironically, one of the major programs we've developed in this country to keep people out of jail, which is probation, say so we'll supervise you in the community, is a major feeder to our jail system. And so, we're gonna, yeah. so here's someone, by the way, who's in the community. They may, they may have a job. They may be responsible for child support. They may be responsible for the care of their child. There is a technical offense, a te technical probation violation, and they go back to jail, may lose their job, may not be able to take care of their child. Lose their but, but that's, but that's what, what occurs. And we are paying uh, a huge amount of money for that person to be there. That, that may get a sense of where we're going with this, my comment. Now, let's talk about uh, another issue uh, and we're going to talk about some big issues. What about, what about bond? As you know, we have a system here where courts uh, release people on bonds. And some of these bonds are relatively, relatively low. And, and generally, if you have a $1,000 bond, which occurs, or a $2,500 bond, you have to pay the bail bondsman 10%. Maybe there's a little bit of premium on the low one, but for a $1,000 bond, you have to pay $100. And if you can come up with $100, you're not in jail because it's already been determined you're not a safety risk. You wouldn't get a low bond if you were safety risk. Or $2,500 bond, you gotta come up with 250 bucks. So let's talk about who's in jail simply because they can't come up with the $100 or the $250. Right. Okay, this is so not unique to Cuyahoga County and it's across America why we've talked about bail reform because there are so many people that are in jail. We talk about, you know, we're going to get into that, the socioeconomic, the substance abuse, homeless, poverty, all those kinds of issues that really are playing out in our justice system that can't come up, as Jeff said, with $100 or, or $1,000. And they sit in jail for a very long period of time. And here, when I was able to take a snapshot, you have a, 30, a third of the population in jail had a $25,000 bond posted, meaning they'd have to come up with $2,500. And they've been in jail for in excess of two months. Uh, and so it breaks it down. But you also had a study that was done by the Pretrial Justice Institute back about two years ago, and they did a deeper dive on the database and said that 25% of the felony pretrial population remained in jail the entire time and never bonded out. But I think so, another, another interesting one is that people that have been posted bond or are re, have been approved to have a PR bond, a personal reconnaissance bond, where they're told to show up in court, they're still spending over a week in jail. So you know, this is a big problem when you've actually posted bond or you have a PR bond, why are you still in jail? Or why is it taking a week or 11 days to get somebody out of the jail? And these minor bo bonds are a bigger problem, primarily because even if somebody has $100, a bondsman doesn't want to write a $1,000 bond. It's just a waste of their time. So while they've got the appropriate bond for the offense, even though they have the $100 or the $250, they can't get a bond written, so they end up clogging up the system. This is this other major thing we developed as a country years ago, the two major things about keeping people out of jail, probation, which is a feeder system, as they do any kind of technical violation coming in, and the idea of bond and posting bond is to you know, put a little skin in the game, you're going to have some money on the table, that's going to make sure you appear in court. The pretrial population, this is going to assure your appearance in court, and now what we're finding is bond and even low bonds for low-level offenses is who I'm looking at in the jail population with very low-level bonds. So it's, uh, you know, idea was to keep people out of jail, but in fact, the way that bonds have been set and we have so many people without economic means, it's a large percentage in every jail in right. America, and, which and, is and, why the issue of bail reform. So here's my one, my one minute. Now. Just think about this in economic terms. So we have a huge number of people who are in that jail for at least 55 days because they can't come up with 2,500 bucks. All right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's longer. It's longer. So, so, so think about what you are doing as a taxpayer. The decision has been made by someone 
that they're not a safety risk. If they were a safety risk, you wouldn't let them out on bond, right? They're not a safety risk. No bond. So now what you're saying is, okay, because for this issue, we are going to spend, as taxpayers, $120 a day to keep that person in a jail that we're, by the way, going to pay the capital expense for. They're going to be there for an average of 50 days or more. So uh, we're going to spend over $10,000. And by the way, you're going to spend a lot more than that. You know, if we just come, if we just give him, him the twenty-five hundred dollars, we'd be saving seventy-five hundred bucks as taxpayers. But what's happening while that person is in jail? They go to jail. They, if they had a job, they lose their job. If they were taking care of a child or doing something like that, someone else has to do it who can't go to work. The disruption is extraordinary, and this is with no safety risk because once again, we wouldn't have said they could be released. And most of this is for felony four, felony five, misdemeanor. These are not crimes of violence. These are not crimes with that kind of a risk. So what are we doing and what are we thinking about here? I mean, it's just strange. So in any event, so we have that issue. All these people, we have people in our jail because of technical probation violations. We have people in our jail. And by the way, as you'll see from the studies, I want to say one more thing. When you go from a bond situation to a release on recognizance or no cash bond situation, guess what? The, the return rate actually is better, not worse, because you've done your pretrial work. You've done some analysis. Why don't you talk about that for a minute? Well, just the last bullet is very important that those that were released on a PR bond, a personal reconnaissance bond, and to tell you, you have to appear in court. We're no not cash. Put these, no cash has the lowest failure to appear rate. In other words, only 12% we, you know, do not appear in court. All the other bonds, if they do finally get out after they've been in jail for two days and lost their job and everything else, has a higher failure to appear rate. Again, setting bond is only to try to assure, well, safety, obviously, for the community, but assure your appearance in court. Mm -hmm. And those that put no cash in that are PR bond out have the highest appearance in the courtroom. So that's an important fact. Counterintuitive, but think about it. You're, you're telling these folks, we trust you. We have the system. Now, they have done some work to make sure they're the right people for release, but they return. So there is nothing about cash bond that makes sense. Yes. And I think there's an important point here also that this is not anything that was unknown to the justice system. There's been multiple studies done over the past several years, study groups, people get together, look at it, pre-trial bail reform, bail reform. I think the, the, the big difference was having the steering committee with every representative of the stakeholders and county and city government sitting there hearing it and recognizing that these decisions they make will save not only a lot of money for construction and operations. Yeah, we, yeah and we haven't gotten there yet, but let me just tell you, I, I'm gonna get there in a minute. What's happening right now is any individual judge, individual judges are still using cash bonds. And the idea is, on a narrow basis, I don't want to be the person who puts someone on the street who then commits a crime. And when it's left to the individual decision of a judge, or it's the way I've done business, quite frankly, this doesn't change. Um, what we're going to tell you about is how you have to go to get systemic change. And by the way, it was only when we put everybody in a room and started talking about this, because in order to have bail reform, it has to be systemic. It has to be multiple judges, multiple courts, the prosecutor, and you have to have a system to do this, which is which is the next part of our story. But one, just one very important point: where cash bail has been eliminated throughout the country, because there are major jurisdictions, uh, there has been no increase in crime and no increase in the a failure to appear in court. So there's, we have examples across the country where this has happened. And uh, okay. I want to talk about one more issue, and then we're going to take a break, right? And I, but it's going to be a short break, uh, because we have a lot of information here. And I'm, I'm saving the good stuff till the end. And if we don't get to it, you don't get to hear it. Um, uh, but uh, let's talk about the other major issue. The other major issue is that when we do a review of who is in our jail, a, and this is varies based on the statistics, but something like 60% of those individuals, and maybe more, uh, their primary issue is not crime. Their primary issue is serious mental illness. 
why don't we take a minute and talk about okay, that? So nationally, it's as high as uh, 15 to 45 or 50 percent. Actually, this slide was uh, presented back in August, and that recently there's been. We now have data, so you can right, talk right. about the data. Well, half, half the 41 percent of the population, the jail has a serious mental illness. They're on psychotropic medication. Uh, and we see this across the country. Again, what's driving jail population, mental illness, substance use disorders, or both, co-occurring disorders, homelessness, poverty, lack of housing, that's who's in American jail today. Everything that we're not do do dealing with within the society, and certainly Ohio, very hard hit with the opioid crisis, and that's a big population of that substance use disorder. But again, recently when they were actually across tabulate between Metro Health, which provides mental health services, and intake into the jail, uh, it's 41% with a serious so, mental illness. So what they were able to do is on a given day, uh, 900 people in that jail, their primary issue is SMI, serious mental illness. And I'm talking about you know, uh, psych psychosis, very serious stuff. Um, and why are they there? because it is the convenient place for them to be put. So think about what occurs. Uh, somebody is on the street. They may be, uh, and, you know, and a lot of our population with SMI end up being homeless on the street, etc. So somebody is on the street, uh, maybe they're having an episode, they're acting out, uh, they're in Chagrin Falls, uh, and uh, the police pick them up. Now, uh, they have some choices to make. Uh, what are they gonna do? Well, one thing they can do is try to take them to a hospital and see if that works. They may be waiting three or four hours to see if they can get someone to, because keep in mind, until someone takes them, the cop can't get rid of them. It may take hours. Uh, or, or, what can they do? They can charge them with a disorderly conduct or some minor crime. They can drop them off at the jail and they're gone in 15 minutes. So what happens? Now we have law, someone... Law enforcement's gone in 15 pardon? minutes. Pardon? Law enforcement's gone in like 15 minutes. The state minutes. of mental health population is two to three times the overall average. They're there, they're they're there for time, months. But law enforcement get, get back on the street. But by the way, if, if that individual is on a prescription drug, uh, what's the first thing that happens when they get dropped off at the, uh, at the jail? They take medication they away. They take your medication away. Yeah. Think so about that. Like whatever psychotropic medication and, they're taking and, to stabilize their behavior is taken away at intake into the jail. And at our jail, what was the what did you find in terms of the uh, at the time yeah. when we started? It's changed a little bit. Yeah. The, the capability of dealing with these folks in the jail. So what, what happens when those people come to jail? So they come in and maybe they're in the middle of an episode. Uh, and and they, again, if they are stabilized, their medication is taken away. So they go into a housing unit and maybe two or three days later, whatever the delayed reaction might be they start acting crazy or you know something's gone off because they are mental they have a mental illness and so then fights will start in a housing unit and then they take them to metro to the metro health uh, the provider and uh, one of the things in all my interviews throughout the county that I discovered is that if they were already being seen by a mental health agency in the community and were on medication the, they will try to find that medication but the formulary in the jail because it's so expensive for what medication you can give to deal with mental illness might not be the right medication that person was on so again it's like a cycle that they get put in a specialized housing and they come back to general housing and cycle through and they stay a much longer length of time than the average daily uh, so the population. bottom line and we're gonna take a break now uh, the bottom line is what we find out is number one uh, we have a huge number of people who come to that jail primarily because we we don't have anything else, or the, the police don't have anything else to do with them. They come in, they become incarcerated. Uh, I, I assure you, if you have a mental health issue, the worst place for you to be is thrown into a cell uh, in that jail. Uh, your problem becomes many times worse. We are paying to staff and have that person there, uh, to house them there. It's the most expensive way to do it, the least effective way to do it and other communities have found alternatives to all of this. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take a five minute break. We're going to come back and we're going to, let me just tell you what we're going to do. We're now going to start telling you about solutions to all this, both short term solutions and what we're thinking about in terms of long term solutions. We're not going to spend a lot of time telling you about what we're programming for the new facilities, but what we are going to do is then I'm going to take the last part of this and I'm going to show you what we showed our committee yesterday, which are the, the nine options for what we might do with a new jail and a new courthouse, okay? Behind schedule, and we started a little bit late, so I wanna get started again.
So I, I should point out um, uh, what has been going, as we develop all this, and I'll just say a little bit while people take their seats. So we have had a series of meetings with this steering committee, these 12 and then a, and, and others. These are public meetings, by the way. If you want to come to these meetings, you can come to these meetings. They're pretty fascinating. They go three or three hours. There's some intrigue. There's a little bit of politics. Uh, We've had some fun with the Bar Association, uh, I'll just say. And, uh, uh, but these have been interesting meetings and we develop these topics and, and we work through them. Now, in the course of doing this, uh, and we don't have time to do this in great detail, but we determined a whole series of factors that actually drive the jail population. And I'm putting these up here because we don't have time to go through all of these factors I've talked about a few of the biggest ones, but we are also then looking at opportunities. And there's some big ideas here, and we're, there's a lot of things here. There's detail and detail, and here's a list here of things that drive uh, the jail population, and we continue on with this list. Um, um, but I'm going to tell you that in all of this, uh, there are some very big ideas and I'm going to tell you and I'm going to kind of summarize because then we're going to go back through the big ideas. What are the big ideas that drive jail population or say it a different way? What are the big solutions that could make a difference? Well, one of them is bail reform. Uh, if we simply had a method of doing something about cash bail and converting it to something else and then managing that. That's a big idea. A second big idea is what we refer to as diversion. There are all these people with serious mental illness. And I'm going to come back to some graphics on this. And by the way, this also there's also diversion opportunities for those people whose principal issue are, is addiction. But what if, rather than taking them to the jail and incarcerating them, what if we had something else that we could do? What if we could train police and other people to not take them to, to, to the jail, but to take them to a diversion facility? Something which is designed to deal with their issues. Don't incarcerate them, treat them. What a novel idea. Uh, don't bring them into a situation that makes it worse. The, while it takes assets to do that, the dollar that you take to do that is far less than the dollar to put them into the justice system, not to mention the fact that the outcomes are dramatically better. Two big ideas. A third big idea is something called central booking uh, and what goes with it. And we're going to talk a little bit more about central booking because if you're going to have ideas about getting people out of the system quickly or not incarcerating them uh, either because there's reasons they shouldn't be there, cash bail, these probation issues. What if we had a way of keeping them apart from the system, doing it in a centralized way and getting them out of the system? Uh, this is a concept that we're going to refer to as central booking. We'll come back to that. And these are three big ideas. By the way, there's other ones, but in the time frame we have, we're going to talk about the, we've talked about them, we'll talk about these. And then there's two things that go with these ideas to make them work. Number one, information. If you don't have information and information, information management, you're not going to do a very good job of working with these systems or having the data. And the second thing is you need to have a champion in the community or an entity that manages jail population and coordinates it and drives it because this takes coordination among multiple entities. So I'm going to go uh, to show you a couple slides and we're going to come back to those ideas. So first of all, uh, let's just talk a little bit about incarceration rate. Uh, this is an interesting graphic. Our, and, and while Karen told you that this, these are problems everywhere. Uh, our incarceration rate is 23% higher than the average group that we'd be looking at. But here's the key. There are communities that have figured this out and their incarceration rate is much lower. Uh, 
And you can see some of these. Our incarceration rate in Cuyahoga County is 1.76. Uh, the, uh, if you look at some of these jurisdictions, uh, you'll see incarceration rates below one. And some of these are some, some pretty surprising places. Uh, you know, Detroit, 0.96. That's pretty surprising compared to what we have here. Chicago, Cook County, far less. Now, by the way, you notice what happens when their incarceration rates go down? So take a look at Cook County. They build a bunch of jail space. That's unused jails. What's happening right now in New York City, Rikers Island? Talk about that for Population a minute. Population size, 22,000 inmates. It's down below 8,000 inmates in New York City right now. So when people have embarked on this justice reform, it's below 10, they're planning for eight. eight planning eight. for eight. That's their goal. But it's, but I mean, and then you can see there's but, some of the jurisdictions where, the, yeah. hence the story, before you start building a jail here in this county, we have come full circle and make sure you're on the right side of history because there are a lot of empty jail beds around where people have done this reform with no increase in crime and no increase in failure to appear in court. By the way, imagine this. New York City, what, what, what was that number they're getting down to again? Their, their goal is 8,000. They're below 10,000. They're below 10. Their they goal is 8,000. That's New York City. That's 10 million people, right? Cuyahoga County, 1 million people. And we're, we were planning for a jail for 29 or for 2600 people I mean you know it, it's it's absurd so in any event uh, so the questions are how should we plan for the future what is the impact of building a new jail assuming business as usual and we've told you that would be 26 if we could get these numbers down what a huge difference it would make and also is there something we can be doing about this now do we have to wait for this new jail, this new system, or can we do, be doing stuff right now? So, first of all, so here's the issue, and let me go back in time a little bit. So Karen had to present this to the steering committee, and she said, okay, here's what I'm gonna tell you. So once again, we went back to the average daily population, and we know what that curve was like. And Karen said, the way we would typically do this, we'd look at a high growth, a moderate growth, and a low growth formula, business as usual. And depending on what points you pick on the 10-year curve, you can, you can do it different ways, right? But even the lowest growth curve, if you take the best points on this graph, business as usual, and average them, you're still going to find out uh, that uh, your, your base forecast is still going to get up to, uh, what was it, 2,100? the next chart. Yeah. Well, no. Well, well, before I do that, I want to say the one thing. We did three forecasts. And then we said, what if we change the system? What if we force people to change the system and do some of the basic things we're talking about? Then what would the forecast be? So then I'll, I'll show you the numbers. So what we basically said is, and, and keep in mind, if you're going to do this, you're building this thing to last until 2040, 2045. You've got to build it for that capacity. If we just kept business as usual with those rates, I mean, we would be in these astronomical numbers. And by the way, this pretty much between here balances the numbers that our other consultants were looking at. But what we're basically saying is if we were able to get system change, we can get those numbers down and even lower than what we're talking about here. So we went, and I want to kind of rush through this because I want to talk about the solutions. Uh, and by the way, the, this uh, prison policy initiative, this is the guidance that our consultants and others give to communities. We urge counties to think twice before expanding their jail system and instead focus on reducing jail populations by creating more options for pretrial release, uh, ending the, the practice of jailing people for unpaid fees, We're talking about uh, there, you know, a bail and, and, and probation, expanding community treatment for mental illness, which we're talking about in substance abuse disorders, and simply reducing the number of jailable low level offenses, including technical violations of probation. Everything we've been talking about here, right? So we went and to back to our committee, and we said, Look, here's what we think you can do. We think that with implementing techniques aggressively, we can plan for a jail with 1,600 beds. 
1,600 beds, 1,000 beds less than what this other consultant was talking about. Now, we recognize that we may be wrong, and so we're going to create a core that can accommodate up to 2,400. But by the core, we're just talking about you know, the core services, uh, security, food service, sort of the core, but the money is in these housing units. And that's what makes the difference. And we're saying we want to plan for 1600, have the ability with a core that if we had to put more modules on, we could go up. But if we did that, not only will we save uh, a billion, billions of dollars over time for the taxpayers here, we will, we'll create better outcomes for everybody involved. Uh, so this is the expansion. And I will tell you that the steering committee has agreed to this. So that's what we are doing. Now, that's a huge commitment. We went back to the steering committee and we said, okay, now if you're gonna make this commitment, you've gotta drive this process of population reduction. And we are in the process right now, and they said, who's gonna do it? And they said, well, we're gonna do it. Which means you're gonna do it, by the way. We're gonna do it. But, but so we have started a series of initiatives to get this done. Now, some of these things you can do in the short term and some in the long term, and we're still struggling how, with how to do it. Uh, but one of the things that we talked about, and this is a little old, is forming this, this committee. It's a jail population committee. And just yesterday, we're talking about who's on this committee. It has to be coordinated. And the reason it has to be coordinated is you have to have someone to drive these agendas, plus it takes multiple entities. Uh, you can't have and, and by the way, there was the, at, the, uh, at the judicial conference, we put, we did polling at the judicial conference. We said there's one of three, anybody here that went to the judicial conference? Okay, you, saw, you guys saw the polling. Well, I don't know if you were there at the point at the beginning though. We did the point at the beginning and we said, okay, and there were about 20 judges that were polled and others. And we said for bail, for example, there's one of three ways that this has to be done. Either we leave it to the discretion of individual judges, but give them guidelines or we let courts enforce it for the courts, or we have a community-based process. It's coordinated across the community. And what does that mean? It means trying to have uniform guidelines that everyone follows. It means not being able to have one, one issue at one level and another at another. Uh, and, and they all, they voted 80% said we want a community-based system. You, yeah. go ahead. Well, because there is one other way, and that really comes back to what the legal community can do professionally. New York and California have legislated bail reform. Ohio has recommended it via the Supreme Court. But New York legislated that there will be no more cash bail. It's being challenged, but it was legislated. California has legislated. It's being challenged by the bail bondsmen, of course. but. You know, there, is, there are things that the legal community can do, that communities can do professionally to actually make these things happen, whether individual judges or individual counties want them to happen or not. And again, based on what the, your, your mm -hmm. theme is for this education, that is part of what a takeaway could be, what you can do to talk to legislators about what needs to be done to have more fairness in our system. We are doing this in the absence of a legislative solution. And I will tell you, and by, and by the way, the, the, the guest I wish I could have brought for this segment is Mark Stanton, who's our public defender, uh, who is, is pas so passionate about this that if he started to talk about it, he would turn red uh, right now because he's, he's just, uh, he, he'll actually say none of this matters if we don't do bail reform, uh, by the way. The issue is this. We've had guidelines, we've had studies, even the Supreme Court has come up with guidelines, but nobody is forcing the implementation. It's been a frustration, it will continue to be. And there are a lot of judges, I will tell you, especially downstate, but there's judges right here in, in, in Cleveland who privately say, don't take my ability to make my determination as to what happens with people in my court. And by the way, if you give that to somebody else, don't blame me if that one person out on bail does something wrong, which is just crazy because the, it, 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 it's overwhelming in terms of the benefit of doing this. So, but we do want to have this sort of a system. Uh, talk for a second, if you will, about the whole issue of information 
management. And be, but before you do that, I'm going to give you an anecdote. I, don't, I actually don't let these people talk at all. Uh, <laughs> they're just here. They're just here. They're just here. So, so you know, I have some basis for saying what I say. <laughs> Cuyahoga County. Uh, our information management systems are so bad that we actually don't know, haven't known at any given time who's in the jail or why on a very fast basis. And I'll give you an example of this. So as you know, uh, there came a point in time when the, when the inmates from the city jail, which is in the police administration building, were transferred over to the county jail. That didn't go well, as you know. Although if you'd seen the city jail, you'd understand that the city jail was, is, is horrific. And you'd understand why at least it, did, it should have made sense. So what happened was, and, and the city was paying about $98 a day for these inmates, which also didn't make any sense because the county's cost was about $125 a day or more, another problem with this approach. And there was no room for them. But there comes a point in time uh, when the city gets the bill. Uh, you know, uh, and I don't know the numbers. The bill may have been six hundred thousand dollars for a period of time, and the city says, "Wait a minute, we're chopping two hundred thousand dollars off that bill." And the question is, why? Well, we've looked at it. And here's what happened: There's a bunch of these people who who did make bail, but from the time they made bail to the time you figured out where they were in the jail and released them. In many cases, it was 72 hours or more. Someone made bail. Or seven days. Or seven days. They made bail, and it still took days and days and days for them to be processed out. And the city said, why should we pay for you know your hotel services of someone who shouldn't have been there? Now, of course, the anecdote is not what the money's not what's important. What's important is our information systems are so bad that we can't track stuff. So talk a little bit more generically about all that you've seen, both of you, on information and what has to be done. Right. Uh, well, I, the, the table's about average daily population in the jail and admissions to the jail monthly to get some trend data on what has been happening. Those were special runs. And in other jurisdictions where I go in, I, I'm immediately able to get history of average daily population in the jail. Or in some states, it's even recorded up to the state uh, an agency, so they're monitoring jail population in all of the jails. The profile information was a laborious process of going through to say, I'm not even asking for history. I just want to be able to come back to say factually today what is really driving the jail population who's in there. And if you don't have an information system when you've got 2,300 or 2,200 now, I think it's the population today, in jail, it's very difficult to, like this example, if someone's posted bond, why, why are they still there for seven days? Well, because they don't really have a good integrated system. Uh, you know, there's 100 different prisoner codes. It's a very, you know, it's a spread out jail. Uh, so without good information, and also somebody whose job it is to be, as I call it, the jail expediter or the, the client advocate, to really every single day look at who's in jail, why has somebody been here for 100 days, Did they, you know, we need to clear up a warrant to get them out, whatever it is, if you don't have somebody doing that every single day looking at who's in the jail, uh, you know, you're gonna have people that get lost in a big jail like that. And, um, and that's one of the reasons that came up with the city of Cleveland when I interviewed them saying, we're not paying these bills because if they bond out, it's not our fault that you can't find them and get them out for two, three, or seven days. And that was, that's one of the critical issues we presented just uh, yesterday about a jail population managed committee being able to get metrics on what's going on. And Jeff pointed out the discussion of what that would be, but it's also important that the people that participate in that can act. That they can go talk to Judge X and say, Judge, Judge X, you have 80 people that have been in jail for 80 days. What are we going to do about it? Because it's not simply meetings and reporting. It's having people that can take action when they get that information. But until they can get the information, even if they had all the best intentions to take action, they really can't. Right. So we, we need a, an effective information management system. And if you've been following the county's efforts on other information management systems, we want something separate and distinct to, to make this happen. It's got to be integrated with everyone's information management. Now I'm going to turn to diversion. I mentioned this before. So one of the realizations was that we don't have to wait for this new Justice Center to talk about diversion. We can start implementing diversion now. So we actually undertook, uh, through our group, a separate study. And let me tell you what we have done and where we're at. We just reported on this yesterday. 
we have actually been able to gather data. It was difficult, but we now know the number of people who are currently in that jail who would be able to, who, who, should, who would not have been there had we had an effective uh, diversion strategy. Now, keep in mind, we have to look at this in different groups. There are people whose primary issue is serious mental illness, but because they were also uh, you know, violent, have committed violent crimes, maybe gun offenses, you would still have them detained. You wouldn't let them uh, just into a diversion facility. But we've been able to do an evaluation of various ranges of people and determine what that group is that absolutely uh, you know, do not need to be detained, do not need to be locked up, should be in a diversion facility and should have been. And that number is somewhere right now in the, in the range of 200 people right now that we can c c clearly identify. So what we are doing right now, we've identified the population and there are going to be various providers in the community that are anxious to start to try to provide diversion facilities. Uh, as we define what resources are required, how it's going to work, we're going to look at some of those facilities and there's going to be funding available. There's some state capital money. Uh, we think there's going to be foundation money. And also, as you may have seen, Armin Budish already in the budget has put aside two and a half million dollars a year at minimum to start to staff these facilities. So we're engaged in the process of figuring this out. And let me just point out what this graphic shows there's various levels at which you can have diversion. Uh, one idea, you know, the, the primary thing is you, you get the person who first, you know, the, the, the arresting officer, or the, what would have been the arresting officer, the police officer, and you know, the first decision is getting them trained to take someone not to jail, but to a diversion facility, if there is one, that's step one. Even if someone comes to the jail, and this gets into our central booking, have the ability there to still take a look and triage there and say, don't further the incarceration process, this person goes to a diversion facility. So we talk about methods, and that's what this funnel is, at different levels uh, of trying to get people diverted out from the system. Which also takes a good information system to go cross agency between the jail to make those connections. And a slide, the previous slide, that it's a very messy yeah. slide, but Jeff skipped over it. I don't know if any of you are involved in the stepping up initiative. There are a lot of people from the community that met a couple of years ago and it's ongoing to actually document where mental health and substance use disorder population that's being already served in the community intersects with the jail so that there could be better ties back, not just to a facility, but even just community-based mental health and substance abuse programs. But this all takes information information management, yes, exactly. it takes facilities, and it takes coordination, and it takes a coordinating entity to see that this is all happening. So we have to and then put going, all that. One uh, thing on the, the diversion slide I always say about a funnel, it's not that those programs that Jeff's talking about, whether it's a community-based or other kind of facility, is free, but again, as opposed to a jail bed, the cost of constructing and operating it, it's much less expensive and much better right. outcomes. So now I want to talk about central booking. Uh, and I, I, there's a lot of words here we're not going to use. What I think I'm going to do, rather than use the words or even this, uh, I threw some slides in here. Why don't we use these slides and you can just talk about a little bit. You want to use these slides here, Andy, to talk a little bit about what central booking could be like? Well, uh, yeah, yeah I, I could do that. We'll go back. Actually, let's, or do you want to start with it? you want to use this one or do you tell me what you want to use? Uh, just go back to this one. All right. So explain what central booking is, and, and well, we are doing something both long-term and short-term, up to yeah. you. C central booking ultimately would be all, all arrests, all intake would occur at the jail for the entire county. Uh, obviously, that's not something you want to mandate for municipalities, so what we're starting with is the notion that we'll do central booking for the city and the county allow suburban municipalities to opt in. And it's interesting, Judge Montgomery in her discussion said, when the municipalities see that they no longer have the liability or the cost of operating local jail beds, if they have one person in a local city jail, it takes five officers to staff that 24-7. So there will hopefully be some benefits to some municipalities. The notion of central booking is that every stakeholder in this system has an ability to impact the jail population. The prosecutor can reduce charges from a felony four or five to a misdemeanor, which pushes it into, into municipal court and potentially is easier to get pretrial release. 
We have a lot of folks in Cuyahoga County that first appearance do not have legal counsel. Because if you're not assigned to the public defender, when you get to arraignment, an odd case gets a public defender, an even case gets private counsel. So there's no, there's no counsel for arrestees until they get to arraignment on <laughs> felonies. So the, bringing the public defender in and saying they're going to represent everybody if, unless they have retained counsel already. So that everybody has the advice, the legal advice about what their situation is important. The city has instituted, and Jeff will probably show this slide later, pretrial, mm -hmm. which has cut their pretrial investigation and then pretrial release, yeah. which has cut their population by 50%. Yeah, let's in the let's jail. take a, uh, we'll take a second on this and then we'll come back. Yeah, we'll come back to this. Uh, or do, do you want to talk about this for no, a second? Go, come back? go ahead. Okay, Karen, why don't you I'll talk, about talk about this slide? This so really so let me, let me, uh, you see, I have yeah. to control this whole yeah. thing. I can't let these people do this. Um, <laughs> let me talk. Let me talk. Let me talk. No, no. The, uh, I'm so shy. Yeah. So, so here's this concept. Let me, let me just talk to you about as a concept, and then we'll come back to the slide. The idea is we want a, in the flow chart, a, a physical place with services where before people get incarcerated into this system, they come. And there's the ability right away to do several things. Number one, determine whether they actually have to go into the system. Determine right there and then whether they are, it's possible to get them released right there and then on their recognizance or no cash bail. And actually, that's, that's as far as they go. They don't get into the system for all that happen. They don't have to go through the ranger. It happens right, right there. If right there and then there's a medical issue to deal with it right there and then and take care of it. If there's one last opportunity for diversion, deal with it right there and then without letting them get into the rest of the system. So that's what we're talking about. Now, on the issue of uh, pretrial services and early release, this is actually an area where the city is far ahead of the county. So this is where we're going to describe this. Okay, so when, starting in January of this year, everyone that's going through the Cleveland Municipal Court is being screened by a pretrial screener and doing an assessment so that it can go before the judge to talk about the risk level, not just based on offense, which isn't the most valid predictor anyways, but that you need to look at that. But other, do they have a job, other kinds of information, what's their financial uh, capability? And if they, the recommendation back to the judge is you know, PR bond, or if they're a little bit on the line, that they actually have hired 12 staff that uh, will help supervise them to, again, assure their appearance in court. So they may have to meet with someone in pretrial services every week. Pretrial service staff does a call reminder, don't forget tomorrow's your court date. If it's a kind of a higher risk, they could even put an electronic monitor or do a, require a urinalysis. But again, to appear, assure their appearance in court. When they started this project uh, and doing this screening, the city had 240 inmates a day in the jail that were uh, Cleveland Municipal uh, inmates. And that's down to 120. They have cut in half the number of people that are under the municipal court from 240 to 120 in the six months that they've been doing this screening. And the failure to appear rate was 47%. 40, half the population wasn't showing up in municipal court when they were supposed Before. to. Before. Before. And with this, uh, the, the first six months of their program, and they're even refining it more, it was 12 to 14 percent. So they did spend some money on some staff. They did provide additional supervision. The judges felt more comfortable. People were not being held in the jail, and it cut the jail population in half. And of those that were on the six months of the May to uh, June, 2 percent were non-compliant. I mean, didn't do what they were supposed to do about peering in court or had a dirty urine or whatever it was. But again, population was cut in half, this no was, increase in crime. And this was driven by the municipal courts and the city saying, we don't want people in those jails. People are dying in those jails. What can we do? They, now there's studies on this, but they did this in going to court supervised release, whether electronic monitoring with uh, case supervision, their failure to appear rate is actually reduced, not increased. And you know, people who are actually arrested while they're out, what is the risk? Very, very low, very low, and lower than and, people out on bail. And this was a direct cost-benefit equation, because if you took 692 people in jail for X number of days at $90 a day, it paid for itself. And more importantly, it cut that human capital. Common Pleas is now adopting the same idea to do pretrial investigations and release. But do you know how this occurs in the jail today? 
They're talking through steel cell doors with 16 other people in a group cell trying to make decisions on somebody's future. So in terms of central booking, Jeff, if you want to go to the slide, you know, it's basically an so open waiting. Do you want to use this slide or go back to the graphic? I'll leave it there. Yeah, it, I, I love this slide to describe the concept. So you're, you're, you're forced it, to do it with this slide. It's open waiting. <laughs> it's access to phones to contact a family in case you do need, do need cash bail. Uh, the back side you see here are pre-trial and public defender interview areas. Yeah. So that everything's brought together and what we're looking also at doing is putting this near courtrooms today if you go in here you get booked da, 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 they do everything and yeah you're going to be eligible for lease you still might stay overnight because court doesn't start till the next day and if it's friday you might be there for the weekend even though you're eligible for re release on your own recognizance so we're also talking to the courts about multiple sessions with a magistrate to make release decisions including the weekends because again, while we always talk about this, especially with the county and the city in terms of the dollar cost, it's also the human cost of what we're doing to people. And it's also that human cost, in fact, that the, the scariest part to me of this existing jail is intake, because that's the most traumatized area for people coming into the jail and is probably one of the worst areas in terms of supervision in times of facility. So this is what a modern central booking facility looks like. You, know, you come in, and again, the existing system's lin linear. First, they do pre-admission screening, and we're also looking at central booking as moving the police charging unit in. Because as was pointed out earlier, there's been a ton of people held in the jail with no charges yet. They're brought in, the crime's written up, it occurred, da da da, but now the police charging unit has to decide how they're gonna charge it. Misdemeanor, felony four or five. We're putting the police charging unit right at intake so that they can make decisions on the charge, which will then allow pre-trial to make decisions on release. We're also talking about Sorry. putting a help desk in central, in central booking. A help desk that could tell an officer, you know, maybe you should cite and release this person and take them over to St. Vincent's. They shouldn't be in jail. So the whole intent of this is, is both diversion and better treatment for individuals. So, so, uh, and there are a few facilities in Texas, we hope to tour them, but the bottom line, there's a lot of technical aspects to how this works we're not getting into, but the bottom line is this, uh, and, and we could have, if we had time, we, there's testimonials that we have on people who, and, and the things people worried about, no problem, people worried about security, uh, and as a matter of fact, there were no issues. When you treat people in this kind of a setting, they're actually much better behaved than when you put them in cells and in small holding areas. Yeah. And th this represents what a new facility could be. The good news is on all these initiatives, diversion, central booking, population management, the steering committee, stakeholders, and the county and city administration said, why are we waiting for a new facility to do this? So we're actually looking at implementing this in the existing jail. So what we're doing right now is we are looking, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's challenging, but for the next three or four years or five years until other stuff is up, we are actually looking to implement this in space right now. Uh, and we've, we're looking at doing it probably on the third floor of jail one and moving other stuff out to the old police administration building. We're thinking about doing it the other way, but we're actually in that. We don't have time to talk through it, but we're thinking about doing this right now, and the benefit of doing the, this right now is we'll get a head start. It'll start to work. We can see how well it works. It's our experiment, it's our laboratory for the future major facility, and we're also trying to get, keep in mind, the idea here is this will work for the county, uh, you know, for the sheriff, this will work for the city, but what we really want to do is we want to have situations where suburban uh, uh, courts, they start, because eventually a lot of those people end up at the county anyway. Anyone with a felony is going to end up at the county. Uh, so we want them to come down and use these facilities. Uh, because then they're not going to have all that expense. Garfield right now is thinking about spending $8 million, by the way, for a Garfield Municipal Court and Garfield Jail. I mean, how good would it be if we could consolidate our municipal courts as well into one place and get rid of all those municipal courts, but certainly with the jail they could use this facility uh, because felonies will end up here anyway. Um, so what I want, and these are the big ideas we talked about. Very quickly, I'm gonna spend two minutes on the courts. 
because uh, that's important too. And let me just tell you, courts, you take a look at what we have, you take a look at what we need, all right? I'm just going to tell you, and I'm not going to go through this. These are all the components, all the things that are housed in the Justice Center. It's not just the courts. It's the courts, it's the clerk, it's the county prosecutor, it's the public defender. They're actually housed there and in three other buildings. We want to consolidate all that. It's a huge amount of stuff that we want to consolidate. Uh, these are the kinds of numbers of, of all the square footages. Um, I, I would like you to turn the camera off now, but I know you won't. Okay, here's the issue. Since 2008, the, the work of our court, of our common police court, has gone down. Since the, the number of filings has gone down significantly. 56,000 filings to 34,000 filings. Okay, and you can look at the different areas. Filings have gone down about 44%. The number of judges has stayed the same. Um, if you take a look at uh, the, uh, uh, you can look at this in different ways, uh, but the number of filings has gone down. Uh, it may uh, be the case that the workload of judges is tied directly into the number of filings that they have. Uh, I will tell you that the population right now, we have 34, 34 common police judges, 34 common police judges. Our population is about the same as uh, Franklin County right now. Franklin County has 17 common police judges because they've increased some. We've been at 34 forever. Uh, the amount of filings per judge handled in Franklin County is 40% higher than the amount of filings handled by our judges. Now, um, uh, domestic relations is different. Domestic relations because it's a different, it's a different idea. And actually, they're going to have increased stuff because they, as we get an older population, there's a whole group of things they have to do in domestic relations. Um, municipal court filings. From 186,000 in 2008 to 83,000 in 2018. Uh, filings have gone down. Think about that. If arrests have gone down, if crime has gone down, if population has gone down, we litigate fewer civil cases now. This has all gone down. Um, and we can look at different graphics. Now, there's some reasons why some of it may pop up a little bit or down, but generally it's way down. Uh, housing court uh, we also worry about. It's gone down somewhat. Um, so you might say, well, aren't we building a lot of courts for uh, if all the filings have gone down? Uh, well, we can't control the number of judges. And we can't make an assumption about the number of judges. The number of judges is set by statute. And the way it is done is the, the uh, legislature makes a decision based upon advice from the Supreme Court, the Chief Justice. Uh, and uh, we have no advice right now uh, that says anything other than the number of judges we've had for years. Uh, we cannot go in front of this group and suggest that we're going to build a smaller courthouse. Uh, but we can create a system right now that if the number of judges is reset, we will react because it's basically a function of that. Not only that, we have some very antiquated rules of superintendents. What do our rules of superintendents say? Uh, the Supreme Court's rules. It says that every judge should have his or her own courtroom. There are other jurisdictions where judges share courtrooms. Uh, it may be the case that if you walk over some Friday afternoon to our courts, you will not see every courtroom in the Justice Center occupied doing a lot of business. Uh, we may have some capacity, but we can't share. Uh, it also says every courtroom should have a jury box. Uh, you know, uh, civil, how many civil jury trials do you actually see? Does everyone need a jury box? 
Well, our, our judges also have a civil and criminal docket. We have other jurisdictions that have civil judges and criminal judges, but we're constrained. Every time you, and, and our rules also say that every courtroom should have a jury deliberation room. You can't share a jury deliberation room. Huge space, huge volume, uh, difficult conversation, because this is what our rules supply. By the way, there's another rule uh, in our very good rules that we are going to ignore, I don't care what you say, because it says that every courtroom should have a chalkboard and access to a pay telephone. Um, you know what the rules don't say? They don't say that every courtroom should be ADA compliant. They don't say that every courtroom should have technology that is appropriate to this day and age. I will tell you though, there are other rules of superintendents in other states that are uh, much different. They talk about methodology for having pods of judges who, if, if, even if every judge has a courtroom, every judge doesn't need a jury room. And you could have smaller hearing rooms and then they could switch in their pod when one needs the jury room. There's ways to make this much more efficient, much more efficient. We have constraints. And I'm just gonna leave it at that because uh, uh, that's an issue to think about. So what we want to do, we have about a half hour maybe, we started 10 minutes late, so if we could have a couple minutes to run over of your time, because this will be a very interesting part. So I'm now going to switch to what are the range of options <clears throat> for a new courthouse and a, a new jails. I want to show you one concept, because we haven't gotten into programming, but I want to show you one thing that I want Andy to talk about. So. Early on, I showed you jail one, and I showed you that pod that had 20 cells, supposed to be for 20 people. Uh, there, now there's 40. We don't want that to happen. We don't want to have overcrowded cells. And I told you that with that kind of a pod, we like direct supervision, that's important, but one person looks at that, and then anybody that has to go anywhere else, that's more personnel and more personnel. Talk just for a second about a modern housing unit, if you would. And what's different? Well, let's start with this. Jeff said one person. That one person in a housing unit equates to five people because you're staffing it 24 seven. So every housing unit effectively is, is the equivalent of five staff positions with county benefits count and everything that goes with it. Those units are about 22 to 23 beds. The state allows you to do up to 48. So effectively, you could cut housing staffing in half simply by combining those into a single unit. The other big piece of that is <clears throat> the jails that were designed years ago, and even jail two, require movement of all, all the offenders for programs and services. Jail one, for example, has a recreation area on every other level. It has visiting on every other level. It has central medical facilities. If you start with the fact that you're staffing housing 24 seven anyway, why not put the services at housing and have that one person you're already paying for supervise and provide access to all the services. In the existing jail, there's a lot of complaints about attorneys not being able to see clients. Uh, about community-based organizations being able to come in and provide services. It's all because not only is housing staffing intensive, but the movement staffing is also intensive because it's not that I'm gonna take everybody in a housing unit to recreation, half of them decide they don't want to go, they're just gonna lay in bed. So now I have staffing in housing and I have staffing in recreation also, and I have staffing to get them there. So a modern housing unit basically today we put everything at housing. We have video conference rooms, we have program areas. Every housing unit comes with its own outdoor recreation area. Why? Because I can get up in the morning at eight o'clock, unlock the door, I can see what's going on out there, and you have a choice. You can be outside, you can be inside. It's also no longer my responsibility to make sure everybody gets access to the outdoors one hour a day, because it's free access. It's also been proven <clears throat> to reduce inmate on inmate uh, violence and inmate and staff violence because people can se separate. You could stay in your room, you can be in a day room or activity room, or you can be outside. So the whole intent of what we're looking at <clears throat> for the jail of the future for Cuyahoga County is to emphasize direct supervision, to provide most programs and services at housing, which will increase the area of the building because you're duplicating things 
but your long-term 30-year staffing of operations will be significantly reduced. The other piece of all this, however, is something we've been talking about and talking to jail administration about is changing the culture from a notion that's been operated between the notion of custody and control, I'm here to control you, to an idea that it's about custody and care. Because you look at the mental health por portions of the population, you look at the people we do with it, quite frankly, any of us, no matter what we did, would be out on bail. The people that are left in jail are people that are less fortunate, and we, we have a tendency to treat them that way in our jails. Thank you. I, I, I might. I don't need the mic. So what we're going to do now, so I'm going to tell you there's one assumption as we go through this, and I will tell you the only assumption uh, that we forced to the steering committee because they said keep all options open. The one option that we do not give them is keeping or renovating jail one. And it's for two reasons. It is in such poor condition, and we didn't even tell you about, we, we mentioned it, but the, the whole uh, entryway, intake, everything is a rabbit warren. It's horrible, it's unsafe, it's falling apart. Jail one is not salvageable. And even if you salvaged it, you couldn't do any of this, you'd have bad blocks. So the one assumption is you don't get to keep jail one. Beyond that, we then, uh, and we're going to rush through this, and, I'm, and here's what we're going to do, Andy. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you go through the options. Now, what I'm going to do is what we couldn't do there. You have to be your normal, objective self, and I'm going to be, uh, I'll just say that I would be miscellaneous people commenting on these and just talking about issues and problems with, with what we're presenting. That'll be fun. All right, but right, um, yeah. why don't we, here, why don't you kind of rush, we'll, we'll start through, and, t and, and, and let's quickly go through the options. You mean do the FedEx one? <gasps> yes, go ahead. <laughs> one breath. That's right. Every place I've done this, especially people in county government or city government says, well, why can't we use everything we have? We don't want to replace anything. We just want to kind of fix it up and use it. So we did a range of three options. Expand, renovate, replace the Justice Center in place, including reusing everything we have to rebuild on the existing site, because there's a lot of passion for folks that have been on that site for most of their career. The second is, is to relocate the jail, to move the jail to a larger site, uh, have more flexibility in planning and design, but keep the courthouse on the existing site. And the third is, is to replace both facilities, either together or on separate sites. So again, jail one must be replaced. We've covered that, I think, pretty well. The Sheriff's administration, we want to have go with the jail because the sheriff ultimately has responsibility for the jail under, under the former government that Cuyahoga County has. Bring off-site functions in because we have people in Courthouse Square, we have people in other buildings. Solve the parking problem at the courthouse. But with an understanding, and I should have put another bullet on here, there's two things that are foundation for this project that will eventually have to be included in the budget population management for diversion, reduced population, and a robust jail information system, which does not exist today. Right now, we're not talking about any specific sites because we're really trying to get the framework of what's acceptable to the group. So 1A had four sub-options. From reusing everything we have, including keeping domestic relations in the old courthouse, which we would not recommend. Uh, simply because of safety, security, and the quality of what they have, to br maximum reuse with bringing domestic relations in, to partial reuse to full replacement on site. This whole set of options was based on the fact that people want to stay on the same site. Uh, and that we said that we'd show them all these options, so let's we'll keep going. So option 1B, we'll just look at it graphically, it's it a graphically. lot quicker. Yeah. One, acquire a site somewhere contiguous to the existing site. Why? because what, wherever jail one would go, the jail one replacement and expansion would need to be connected to jail two if we keep it. So, 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 so step one, you've, you've already given me my problem of, of my cafe because you're already talking to one, maybe two private landowners about we want your property. 
Uh, plus the fact, I think one of those is actually probably accounted for right now, uh, yeah. maybe. But in any event, that's one issue. Yeah. By yeah. the way, this is not the design of a new building. Uh, <laughs> but it is, it is a blocking model, and I'm going to tell you, that represents the volume that we're talking about for all these things. That's the volume yeah. we're talking about. That's the volume we're talking about. This isn't about design. Yeah. And, and then potentially, county does own this building and this parking lot in the park so potentially there's another solution for parking uh, with a bluff drop off okay. down to the highway similar to what is behind the old courthouse <laughs> demolish jail one expand the court uh, and the one we've chosen to show would include space for domestic relations moving domestic relations from this building over to here after we complete renovation we because complete the space we provide for domestic relations yeah. becomes our swing space to be able to do phased renovation to this tower uh, mm -hmm. Again, jail. The jail always becomes the primary factor because we can't tear it down with that while we have people in it. So that really becomes, no matter what we do, the starting point okay. for for where we go. Advantages: j half of the jail will now meet best practices and have improved operational efficiency. We leave, we have to live with some of the issues of jail too. We have a consolidated justice center. And, this option brings domestic relations in. Uh, potentially, in this case, we would reuse the PAB, <clears throat> but there's a lot of there's a lot of disadvantages, including, we believe, probably the highest cost of anything we would do. And let me All right, and let me say a couple things here. The high-rise jail. We didn't say this before, but the kind of concept we had in mind, if it was a low-rise jail, what you could do is you you do your central core. And then those housing units are pots. You could put the number that you think you need, you know, 1,600, maybe even 1,200 if we do well. If you need more pods, you put more pods on. You can even eliminate pods. Uh, the problem with a high rise jail, uh, as soon as you do a high rise jail, now you can have some, you can still have some operational efficiencies, but as soon as you do it, you're locked in. Uh, to expand that, it's not like you know modular pods. To expand it or to contract it, that doesn't happen. That's a high-rise jail. It is what it is, and that has a very okay. uh, a lack of flexibility. So we'd have to build the shell space just in case you ever went to 2400, which we hopefully would never use. In fact, if Karen has her druthers, we'll only be at 1200 beds. That's awesome. Right. Uh, land acquisition, cell space, also what we call the. Uh, uh, the disruption quotient, you know, for people, the judges are still working in here, the courts are still going on, the jail's still operating, probably have to do off hours work. And if you're familiar with the Justice Center, each of those buildings sits on top of two levels of parking. And because of what this site is, if we tear anything down, we're going to tear down two levels of parking to put new foundations in, which will probably go 200 feet below ground. Yeah, we're in, in, in Cleveland, area. Ohio. We're on Glacial Till. You have to go down 200 feet with auger cast so, piles for any higher rise building. Very expensive, very difficult. So, so we really do believe any of the options, and we're not going through all of them, that would keep us on the existing site are probably going to be the most expensive and have the longest time to completion. So, so now keep in mind, this is assuming we make, and by the way, we still can't make all the programmatic changes we want with this, because we have inherent problems in some of these, like jail two. Uh, uh, but uh, people always assume that renovation and, and, and use is the least expensive. It's actually the most expensive. It takes the most time and there's the most uncertainty. Jean-Paul Carlihan, who was a partner in Shepley Bullfinch out of Boston, was asked once about the old post office in Washington. And he said, just because it's old doesn't mean it's good. And just because it's still standing doesn't mean it's worth renovating. Right. So let's go on. Uh, so we're going to jump to the option 1D would be to do full replacement. Which means we end up with a major jail on the where the PAB is, yeah, Police so, Administration Building, on a major boulevard. Yeah. So let's just let's just talk about this for a second. It's a full replacement now. Just think about this. By the way, there was a lot of complaints. People over here, like on the malls or over here, they were very upset that they had a view of this crappy-looking non-clad jail one or okay, jail. But this won't be crappy-looking. <laughs> Uh, you won't have that view anymore because you're going to have this massive new jail right in Ontario, right on that wonderful boulevard, right across from what we're trying to do with the, uh, you know, activation of, of, of that area. So I'm just saying. As Jeff said, we're being objective. He's not. Yeah. 
<laughs> and then I would also put the courthouse where jail one and jail two is, and then finally we tear the tower down to, to create a lobby entry uh, off of the main street. But again, it has a lot of the same advantages and also the still disadvantages, especially relative to the length of, length of the time that we complete and the cost of construction. Option two is one which br brings about a lot of concern to the system. Quite frankly, the judges are concerned they can't get inmates through a corridor quick enough, so what if we move the jail? How long is it going to take the sheriff to get them there? But we do believe, and if, if I'm on objective, this is probably the best solution ultimately for the county. And we'll just look at one, one example. We showed three or four of these to the group so they'd understand that other jurisdictions faced with the same decision to build a new courthouse and a new jail decided it made more sense to not build the jail downtown, to build it low rise, to allow for expansion, uh, to use a larger site, to provide better access to natural light and to be able to feel the sun on your body when you are in recreation rather than being, you know, in an area deck that's basically inserted into a tower. This is Philadelphia. It's about 20 minutes, 10 miles away. We showed them examples from Lexington, Kentucky that did the same thing. We showed them examples from Maricopa. These were all jurisdictions faced with the same decision. And in fact, Lexington had the jail and the courthouse on the same site, just as Cuyahoga does. And when they really looked at it, it made more sense to build the jail about 10 minutes away, 15 minutes away, than to try to force it onto a downtown site. So if we were going to do that, we would need a site based on some examples of about 16 acres. This is actually Lexington Fayette, which happens to be on a scenic byway in horse country. And just as a, an anecdote, I had to go to a user, uh, community meeting. So we drive up this, this driveway, this beautiful driveway with green verdant fields. We go into this building, which is teak inside. In fact, the barns were teak inside. I said, my, my, what wonderful home you have here. The guy says, oh, no, no, my home's over on that hill. So it was a community that could have said, do a jail or don't do a jail. But it's built right on a scenic byway. But again, this is 1,200 beds in one story. Every rec area f is, faces the sun. So again, what that would be would be to acquire a new campus site, 15 to 20 acres, low rise jail, no parking structure required. And then we would demolish the PAB and start the courts expansion on site. So both projects could start concurrently. Right. Uh, demolish jail one and jail two for additional expansion and renovate the court tower. Probably about a mid-range cost because we're still dealing with all that phase construction if, if we uh, for the existing site. Jeff? Well, and, and now once again, we would go out. There's not as much pressure on uh, uh, being downtown for the jails as there would be for the courts, as you understand. Uh, so we could have that low rise. This still gives you, the, it's the renovation of the courts tower, which has limitations on that. Uh, there is this big concern about the cost and expense of now transporting uh, inmates, uh, you know, busing them back and forth. You may make yeah. one comment about the history of that in some other jurisdictions. Well, right now you're moving about, we're only moving about 200 people a day between the jail and the courthouse. And quite frankly, it's very slow now because they move from the jail to a holding area that's between the two buildings to single elevators, to single holding cells at the courthouse. Uh, the Philadelphia project I showed has holding for 600 in the basement. They move them before six o'clock in the morning and then they start moving them back. We believe, and we're going to go through the detail, that the staff already exists because you're walking those people now. It's a difference for a couple buses. And if everything's successful in central booking and diversion, the number of people we move every day will drop drastically because a lot of that movement is for first appearance, for bond, and for other kinds of hearings. And once again, the issue is what would be the location of the jail? Uh, there are some neighborhoods which would highly object to that. There's other areas of Cleveland where this is actually an economic development opportunity, especially if it's done with the right services. It's not just a jail complex. There's rehabilitation services. There's other things there. There's people who work there. Uh, and you actually, if it's done nicely, it is, it's actually an economic development opportunity. Essex was actually done on the Brownfield site down where the refineries were in Newark. So it was actually, a, from, from an environmental right. perspective, a recapture. So we're going to have to go quickly here. Sorry. 
uh, through this. Three, what if we just do two new facilities and abandon the existing site? Again, there's a lot of passion about the existing site, but that may be the best choice. If we develop common facilities, uh, or if we de develop courthouses, we're looking at about two, uh, about two city blocks uh, to, to do a new courthouse with parking. So we acquire an urban site under the 3C for a new, a new uh, courthouse, a campus site for a new jail, and then we dispose of the existing site, which the value continues to go up on as development continues to occur right. downtown. So let me make a comment about new sites. There's really, a, uh, they may be in here, but we're, we're running short time. There's a couple flavors here. If you wanted to do a new site that had the maximum efficiency of all these buildings, you'd actually do a low rise courthouse, a low rise jail. You're now talking, you know, over 30 acres with parking and everything. And uh, if you were to do that, uh, the problem is you're not going to do that very close to downtown. There's just not that space. The further out you go, uh, the more complaint you're going to have from everybody. Courthouses want to be downtown. Uh, jails don't. Uh, but you, that would be an efficient, effective campus. Uh, if you did solely an urban campus to keep the two facilities together on the same site, you can get closer in on less acreage, but now you're getting into the issue of the high-rise courthouse. So the issues on new build are you can do that or you can find two new sites. Uh, you can find a new uh, downtown site for a courthouse. Uh, and even if it's a mid-rise courthouse, as long as you don't have to connect the jail to it, you can, you can find the acreage. You can have lower acreage. Uh, or uh, you could do a high-rise courthouse downtown and go further out for your jail. But the issue here is one of do they have to be connected and where does the courthouse have to be? So I'll click it. Um, and that's the urban probably site. The costly option. Pardon? This is probably the least yeah. costly option in the shortest time to full, full occupancy. So what we told our panel is we said, look, we, we're going to start weighing these, and we're going to go, and you're going to start giving us your, your, your choices. And we've said, here is the suggested criteria that you have to think about. There's objective criteria, construction cost, how much time uh, it gets, uh, how much time it takes, how much time till you relieve the jails, annual operational cost, uh, long-term operational cost. And we said there's subjective factors. Uh, locational factors, programmatic factors, development factors. We suggested the beginning of them. We've told every one of these groups to look at this list, modify the list, tell us what you think is important on the list. And what we are going to do in the next several weeks is we're going to each group and we're going to make them force rank this criteria. And then we're going to make them force rank these solutions, which is to say you can't, you know, as between A and B, what do you prefer? It's between B and C and just keep weighing options until we force them to give us their preferences at all times also telling them about cost. So until we build consensus. Until we build consensus and 10 out of 12 agree on everything. So what I thought we would do, um, uh, I wanted to leave some time for questions. We, we, there's a lot more, or do we have no more time? No more time. Uh, we'll stick around for questions. Uh, but. Uh, I think I have to tell somebody this, uh, not you guys, but that's the, that's the magic, don't tell anybody who hasn't seen this at the magic study code. Uh, but that is uh, pretty much where we're at, it's what we're doing, obviously we've, we really skimmed the surface, uh, but I think we're at the conclusion here, yeah? Just to, since we're at the conclusion, I just think we could comment given the theme of what your educational ceremony is, or the seminar is. Ceremony, maybe. Yeah. We've actually turned Jeff into somebody that's no longer a building manager into a justice system advocate. I can't tell you how many of these projects I've done with program managers that say, why are you doing all that stuff? Get design done and get under construction. And the comment that I would make is that everybody in this room is a member of the legal community. And can, taxpayers. Pardon? And mostly taxpayers. And taxpayers can impact what the final decisions are and what the county does. And it's important to have advocacy, not just for building a new courthouse, but for example, as I saw from the raise of hands, most of you all are civil attorneys. 
we've actually thrown out to the, the judiciary, what if there was a separate civil docket similar to the business docket? So that all the civil cases aren't backed up by the criminal cases that the judges you, you, are doing. You can't start that with 20 seconds left. In I, the, I, uh, well, <laughs> well, I, I'm not starting that discussion. The, the point I'm making is everybody in here, like Jeff, can be an advocate for what can be better and done right. Yeah. Just, just the one word on that. When we look around other jurisdictions, it's amazing. Florida has eliminated its municipal courts. They have one lower court system. Most other, uh, many, many other districts separate their civil and their criminal courts. If you do that, the gains in efficiency are dramatic and also all of this capital. You don't have to have every judge with a criminal ready jury trial courtroom and all the support. You give that to some judges and then your civil judges don't need that. You can, you can consolidate, you can compress, but we don't think strategically or at least people are not thinking statewide about how to make the system better because all these things are options to make it better. With that, yes? Jeff, just let me ask a question. Your crystal ball, all these, this has been going on for several years as your slide showed. You have all these different constituents. You got all these different committees, committee upon committee, bureaucracy. What do you and your crystal ball feel it's going to take to pull this together? Is this another five years down the road before there's really some progress made in starting construction or at least getting to architectural design? Can we turn that off? <laughs> um, I, I have a view. Here's what I will say, and then you can come up to me, and I'll say some more. Um, I, I, I believe that what's going on right now with the steering committee uh, is the best chance we've ever had to get this done. And unfortunately, I think it's because of what happened in the jails. I believe that we will get a solution for the jails. Uh, and I believe uh, that uh, because we get a solution for the jails, and the courthouse may, may lag behind, uh, either because uh, the urgency to get the solution for the jails is greater, uh, possibly because people may say we're not ready to move forward with the courts right now with those constraints, and maybe that will resolve itself. Uh, but I believe that the jail project will move forward. And, and by the way, because the jail project moves forward, uh, that may, you know, what you do with the jails does inform you about what you can do with the courts. So I'll just leave it at that. Yes, sir. I'm just wondering, you indicated that the, you know, the diversity and wealth between, okay, hold on a second. At the very beginning, you, you mentioned the diversity of wealth is causing the people like in this room to be able to pay these little bonds and the uh, poor people not to be able to pay it. And, and you said the controversy there is that judges want to be able to say that they can set the bonds. So what about just proposing a system where there's almost, uh, I'm gonna use a financial aid, a whatever that term is, where, where a person that has a $2,500 bond, can they can look at the income of that person and determine that 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 person isn't able to pay, so a subsidy takes care of that. That that in itself would get rid of a lot of this there's actually, overcrowding. There's actually a group that does that right now. Uh, there's so many solutions. By the way, there are a million easy ways to solve this. Well, well one thing ahead. about doing that pretrial screening and central booking to ask the questions about financial ability, to have that as part of what's going before a judge. And actually there's a national organization, they're active here, called the Bail Project, and they literally have got through donations and other funding sources. Bail Project does that. They, they go and bail people out of jail. They, you know, but, they've come to some of our meetings, the Bail Project. They're throughout the United States. The and they are actually is, posting bail for people. This is all ad hoc stuff. There's, a, there's, there's this solution, that solution, this plug, this issue. Nothing is comprehensive, nothing is systemic. That's the issue. Okay? Jeff. Yes. Do you anticipate making a recommendation to the steering committee to reduce the number of judges we have? <laughs> no. Isn't that part of your job? No. Uh, because, but. Uh, and the, the reason, the reason is, it doesn't, I can't, here's what we can talk about, uh, and, and 
we can talk about doing something with the magistrates. As long as the state legislature sets the number of judges. Can't the steering committee, though, be a part of moving the legislature and the Supreme Court? <laughs> if they choose to. Well, doesn't it start with you making the recommendation to get him to do it? No. <laughs> I have to work with all of these judges, and uh, this is that's a hot political topic, and we are neutral facilitators here. We're trying to get it done, but in all honesty, that's not it's not our place to make that recommendation. We will supply information, and uh, you know, as a bar association, and others may may think, uh, may, may decide to do that. Uh, in all honesty, if, if we were in the position in these meetings, that, there are judges who do not, do not believe the number should be reduced. And I, I'll just tell you, there are judges who will say, well, the nature of what we do is different up here. The nature of how many judges we need is different. The types of files are different. Uh, and we're not going to get into that argument. Uh, but uh, because that decision is going to be made by others. But we are not going to that's that's one step beyond our advocacy okay thanks for asking the question <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna end this now thank you no frank okay well thank you all very much